the City Council Committee on Administration and Finance, co-posted with the Committee of the Whole, is meeting in person today, Tuesday, May 30th at 6 p.m. for the purpose of discussing departments or fiscal year 2024 departmental operating budgets and capital improvement plan projects as they apply. This meeting is being held in the City Council Chambers, 93 Washington Street, Salem, Massachusetts, on the second floor. Individuals may listen or view this meeting via the platform called Zoom by using the webinar ID 895-8736-0547 and using password 936-862. Present for the Committee on Administration and Finance are all members, excluding Councillor Watson Felt. Also joining us from the Committee of the Whole are Councillors Stott, Varela, Cohen, Prosnuski, and Morcillo. And I think first I'll do just a very quick sort of process overview since it's been a year since we did this. Um, I think all of us have been here for at least a round of this, but uh, as we go through each individual department's budget, we will hear from representatives from those departments. We'll have an opportunity to ask them questions, hear what they have to say about their budget proposals. Uh, we will take separate votes on the personnel portion of their budgets and the expenditure portions of their budgets, and then we will vote what we should do on the sum of the two. And although typically we would start with the mayor, uh, they are in the process of arriving still to our meeting, so we are going to go just a tiny bit out of order and start with our city solicitor. I think everybody has the microphones available to them. Um, so, solicitor, I will give you the floor. Third time's a charm. Well, there we go. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, counselors. Um, what I'd like to do is just run through the numbers a bit. Um, as you know, um, I have two vacancies uh, in the legal department. Um, Vicki, uh, Vicki's position and Sharon Lopez's position. Uh, last year, when both uh, attorneys were here, uh, Vicki worked a point eight schedule, and Sharon uh, was on my budget, on the legal department budget for a point five. So you'll see this year, um, we put in a, a one point, uh, a full-time person, and then we have a point three uh, part-time position that's in the budget. So the numbers, uh, the, the uh, equivalents, uh, full-time equivalents is the same, except we're, we're splitting it up a little bit differently. In addition to that, you will see that there are cost of living adjustments of 2%. There are also an increase in the, um, the salary for the paralegal who has taken on more responsibility uh, over the course of the year. Uh, you will see that there's also an increase in the uh, salary. Uh, we never had a clerk for the DEI commission previously, so you'll see a uh, $1,200 um, payment uh, ability to pay a clerk to do the minutes for the DEI uh, coalition. Uh, in addition to that, there is, uh, we were using some earmark funds that we had from the state for office supplies for um, Virginia's department, um, but that is, um, that is dwindling away. So we put in a $1,500 office supply budget for DEI. She does use quite a bit of supplies in her trainings. Um, so we feel that that is a, um, is a good number um, for her. Um, I think that covers the monetary changes. If you have any questions about that before I go forward. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm sure the counselors will, will chip in if they have any specific questions, but um, 
I wonder if for the purpose of any of the sort of public viewing at home, if you could just give sort of a quick summary of what it is that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. Uh, the legal department represents uh, municipal employees and the boards of commissions. Um, we represent the Zoning Board of Appeals if there is a challenge to a uh, decision that the board made or the planning board. In addition to that, we write legislation, um, draft legislation for the councilors. Uh, we draft home rule petitions. Uh, we handle claims that come into the city for you know, maybe it's a, 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 a ticket or a tow or something of that nature. Um, we handle any lawsuit that is filed by um, the, by someone against the city or um, the city or an employee. Um, what else? Um, we handle my office um, includes the. Um, Public Records Officer also includes the um, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Director, and we also oversee the uh, licensing. Licensing department provides licenses to restaurants, common picture license they're called, uh, alcohol licenses, fortune teller licenses, and auto and auto dealership licenses. Thank you for that. Um, any questions or comments from the committee? Councilor Stott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Beth, for your information as always. Um, you're definitely a department that helps me and your resources have been um, huge for me the past three and a half years, so I appreciate all of the help that you have provided you and your team. Speaking of, your team has definitely seen some reductions, which you, you touched on. I was curious about the, um, I, I didn't quite get the piece that you were saying about the open positions. So you are increasing the hours for the assistant city solicitor, and my understanding is one of the assistants is shared with the police department. Is that similarly going to go forward once it's filled? So. Sharon was unique in that she had prior uh, experience in the police department. So I don't envision that happening going forward. So I'm going to be advertising for a full-time assistant city solicitor and then a part-time, uh, the point three. Um, the, the, the police department has different needs than, than a traditional um, assistant city solicitor would provide, and, and Sharon was unique to that, so she was able to fill both roles. In the meantime, if, if I may, Mr. Chair, in the meantime, while those positions are being filled, are you expecting contractor services to have to be go up, like with um, Robin or? Yes, um, we do have one. Uh, we, we just got an FTA grant, as you might know, for the skipper, and we had one for the ferry. And the one expense that I need to, um, and I'm working on a contract right now, that I may need to come back and speak with Anna about submitting a supplemental for, is a consultant to work on the civil rights package that is required. That's a Title VI. That's a DBE, ADA, uh, public notice, all that that I could. I would generally have done myself, but not able to do that. That's the one big thing uh, that I see coming down the road. Okay. Thank you. And then um, one more question, if I may. The stipend for the four board members, I believe I ask this every year, but I don't see it anywhere within like an ordinance that the board members are paid. Do you have any historical knowledge on that? It's provided in the general law that they may receive a stipend. Sorry? I couldn't. It's provided in the general law. Mass general yeah, law? Yeah, it doesn't set the rate, though. Right. It, you can provide for them to be compensated, but it's not, there's no fee, there's no, no dollar amount tied to it. So you can provide for the board members to be right. compensated a stipend, I'm assuming? Yes, they receive a stipend. And it can, be, it can be set by the city, what that amount is? Right. I don't think that number has gone up um, in my, since I've been working with the board, it has not. Okay, thank you. Further comments or questions? Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Beth, thank you for everything you do. We all rely upon you so much. And I know this last year was very difficult with staffing. So that's, I guess, that's why I'm asking the question here around, um, around your own salary, as far as just what we're, I completely believe that you should be entitled to that and maybe potentially more just for the justification for this. Is it because we're down people right now so, and you're working extra hours? Yeah, so the budget doesn't properly reflect it. Um, the mayor did give Mayor um, Driscoll did provide certain department heads with adjustments in January. So there was a 5% adjustment in January. So that is, that is not reflective here because I had money in my budget to cover it. So the increase for my pay is 2% for July 1. That's proposed. But if you look at it, I, 
question that was with Anna uh, this, this afternoon, but if you look at the budget, it shows you last year's, you know, July 1st money, but I did have an increase in January. Got it. So it's the it's the five percent that was added previously from the last fiscal until now, plus the the additional is it two or three percent? It's two percent. Two percent. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I want to jump in there just a moment, if I can, and maybe direct a question towards Anna. Um, we did take up in this committee earlier in the year some survey-based increases for some spot locations. Is that likely to be the case across that range of positions? Will this budget sort of roll up that increase as well as any sort of cost of living increase that's happening here? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And it will be, um, there isn't a place in the worksheets as they exist in our budget book to sort of show a mid-year adjustment. And so there may be some that look like there are jumps there, but it's, those are the ones where there was a mid-year adjustment to uh, sort of retain during transition times uh, certain staff. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Morcillo. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. Renard, do you, the point three position troubles me. Do you think you're going to be successful in finding someone to work just in a point three job? So in my prior life, um, when I worked for outside counsel, we did have, I was a uh, uh, part-time employee. So it's possible that there may be uh, someone who may want to do some, be, learn how to become an assistant city solicitor or a city solicitor that works in a firm. Uh, I envision there might be somebody like that or somebody right out of law school who could do some research and some, uh, some not difficult work. So I, I don't, there are a lot of people that are reaching out to me now, so I'm not concerned about being able to, to fill that. Um, I just have to be kind of flexible on what I'm looking for. I, so I, I realize this is the budget, <laughs> but I hope we have some sort of a time limit on that and, and have the ability to bump that up if it's required to find somebody appropriate because you have been short staffed for a very long time. Um, I have another question about the board, the licensing board. That's a, it's not required to pay them, right? The Mass General Law just says that you can. Yes, I haven't, I haven't looked at that in years, but when I did look at that previously, that was that's my understanding, yes. Do you think that, I'm just, it, it, there's only like three boards that we pay the members of out of all of the boards that we have in the city. Um, do you think that that's important to retain people for that board position? Um, I'm not so sure. I've never really spoken to the board members about what motivates them. Mm -hmm. um, not 100% sure about that. Have you been on the board a long time? Is it a? Um, no, um, only a few years. Um, Mr. Barrett um, has been there probably three years. They're all relatively new. Um, you know, new meaning three or four years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Councilor Merkel. Uh, thank you, Chair McLean. <clears throat> and also, I want to echo the other counselors. I really appreciate how hard you've been working while you've been short-staffed. It's impressive, and you're, you're incredibly helpful. Uh, I was wondering about the overseeing of the enforcement of the short-term rentals. Uh, I recall um, Vicki Caldwell was doing that, and uh, we had actually worked together and revised uh, an ordin uh, ordinance in regards to that. And I was wondering um, if when uh, a, a second um, solicitor, uh, si assistant city solicitor uh, is hired, if, if they'll be um, resuming that oversight? Absolutely. Number one on the list. Oh, thank you. Dave, I should mention that Dave Rodriguez um, has been assisting um, me over the last several months on a, on a part-time as needed basis, and he's been terrific. Okay, great. Thank you. Council Cohen. Thank you, Chair McLean. I'll be brief. Um, I thought you did a ridiculously great job when you were fully staffed, and i um, not sure how you've done what you've done, so I just want to express appreciation um, as, as we worked together when I ran uh, the then No Place for Hate Committee. I only saw like 1% of what you did, so just wanted to thank you for all you've done in the last year. Thank you.
further questions or comments? Okay, so just a reminder, process reminder, we will take a motion and a vote on personnel, then expenditure, then the roll-up amount, and I'll accept a motion from any member of the committee. Councilor Appworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I'm looking at the right numbers here. Um, this is the 571 and the 492? Or am I on the wrong page? 571 is the roll-up number that I have. Yep, and then the 492 is the personnel. Uh, 490, so we're looking at the FY 2024 mayor. Oh, sorry, got it. Uh, page 552. 492 is the request. Okay. Uh, so we'd, so be, we'd be looking at 497, 87, for personnel, we'd be looking at 81, 100, for expenditures for a roll-up amount of 571, 887. Yep. So I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, non-personnel budget of 571, 887, and the personnel budget of 49787 to recommend for approval. Councilor Hapworth makes a motion to accept the proposed 49787 for the Solicitor and Licensing Board personnel budget and the roll-up amount of 571887, seconded by Councilor Stott. All those in favor? I see three hands, including my own, which is all members of the committee. Councilor um, Watsonville being absent, so that carries. I will note that we did not take up the expenditures in that vote. We did the roll-up amount and we did the personnel. So we'll want a motion for the expenditures as well. A motion to approve the 81,800 for solicitor and licensing board expenditures. Eighty-one thousand one hundred. Did I say that right? Yeah. Councilor Stott makes a motion to approve the solicitor and licensing board expenditure budget amount of eighty-one thousand one hundred dollars, seconded by Councilor Merkel. All those in favor? Three hands plus my own makes four, so that carries. Thank you for joining us. Apologies, Chair. Um, uh, the solicitor also oversees the PEG um, Enterprise Fund, and I, re I recall that we skipped that one last year and we added it at the end, so I was thinking about making sure that we captured that one this, this year. <laughs> Appreciate you so much. Thank you for that. Um, and that's page 867 in the binder, which um, is also in tab 10. It should be in the back of, I, I believe. <coughs> but it should be in the uh, back of tab 10. Yeah, I think the numbers start on page 869. Oh, okay. <coughs> So this is a purely expense-based uh, number. There's no personnel cost included in this. Um, I guess I will ask you to just briefly yes. explain so what the PEG Enterprise Fund so is for. So the PEG Enterprise Fund was established. There was a change in the general law a few years back that required that the money that goes to Salem Access TV um, that is, is paid by the subscribers to Comcast gets funneled through the city and then to SATV. Previously, it went right to SATV. So right now, we we keep track of it. The SATV bills us on a quarterly basis when the money comes in, so it's in and out. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this in particular? <coughs> Seeing none, I'll accept a motion. <coughs> Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Motion to approve uh, the PEG access amount of 691250 Council Hapworth makes a motion to approve the PEG access budget amount of $691,250, seconded by Council Merkel. All those in favor? Three hands plus my own. Matter approved. Thank you for that reminder from our finance director so we don't have to tack it on to the end. 
and I will note that we are glad to welcome our new mayor to our very first budget meeting of the season. Um, if you would like, please take the opportunity to make a general introdu introduction before you dive into your specific section of the budget. Yeah, th thanks, Councillor. Um, so this is a, certainly, a, a, at first I apologize for being late. I had some traffic coming back from puberty from the um, conference track meet for the middle school girls. Um, this is a interesting uh, set of circumstances. I feel like this, you know, this budget process started really in November, December of last year. Uh, Mayor Driscoll kind of picked the recipe. Uh, Mayor McCarthy cooked it up and I get to serve it. So I hope it is palatable. Uh, and I think as you'll see as you've gone through it, if you had the opportunity to go through it, um, there's not a lot of big surprises in here. I think the goal was to really uh, maintain a level of service, not add any major new positions or programs. Uh, it is about a 3.9% overall increase. Um, and the schools went up by 3.5%. Um, some of the big changes that you're going to see are related to our, our collective bargaining agreements. Uh, was, was covered in the uh, at the budget retreat uh, that a, a lot of these were settled at a point when they're now um, being rolled into the budget. So those will be some of the major personnel increases that you're seeing are annualized costs for those uh, contracts. Um, on the capital side, um, most of the projects that are on there are projects you've seen before. They've been in the five-year plan, so there's nothing new. This is really focused on finalizing, completing work on projects or advancing to next phase on projects that have already been in the queue. Um, we'll talk about this as we get through capital, but we really tried to focus, uh, I think, or I should say uh, Council McCarthy really tried to focus on uh, leveraging short-term capital, given the changes in interest rates and avoiding uh, taking on any new substantial long-term debt, uh, and also leveraging our existing ARPA appro uh, appropriation to, to match up against capital needs where those were eligible. Uh, there is a placeholder you'll see in the capital budget for MSBA for the design cost for the high school. And that's probably the largest single item of long-term debt at about $2 million, uh, which will also be uh, reimbursed when, uh, by MSBA as that process moves forward. Uh, I just I want to also take this moment to really give a big shout out to Anna, to her team in the finance department, to Elizabeth and Justin, uh, to Nick uh, who does capital project management, uh, and to uh, your colleague, our former mayor, Bob McCarthy, just really a steady hand. Um, the department heads really handling a lot of transition and uncertainty with, uh, with poise and professionalism, and I think uh, really putting their best foot forward to make sure that despite uh, all the changes that we have been undergoing in this community, uh, that this process is one that is still going to continue with the degree of professionalism and uh, diligence that I think we've all come to expect from our finance process. Uh, I will say that I've not had much of an opportunity uh, to sit and digest this budget. Uh, I had a few meetings with Mayor McCarthy uh, and his team uh, after the election uh, and uh, really started first day in the office this morning at, at, uh, at 8 a.m. So this has been a bit of a whirlwind, but um, the briefings that I've had uh, both with Mayor McCarthy and with Anna and her team um, make me confident that this is a very responsible budget. Uh, like I said, it only increases by about 3.9%, which is pretty typical for the last um, uh, 15 or so years at an average budget increase, and I think uh, really approaches our city finances in the professional, responsible way that we've come to expect in Salem. So grateful for the opportunity to be here, and thank you again, Anna. Thank you for that. So I think we will start with the departmental budget, which the numbers start on page 450, for those who are not already there. And if there are any specifics that you would like to speak to, or Anna, that you might like to speak to as, as you were involved in the preparation, we'll be glad to hear anything further. And otherwise, we'll hear questions and comments from members of the committee and the council. Yeah, um, so I'll just, so I'll, I'll share, um, we have a, um, the staffing uh, amount you see in the personnel section is reflective of the previous model of the office, uh, really taking an opportunity to uh, reflect on that structure and um, anticipate possibly making some modifications to that, ideally within the budget. But if we do um, require uh, the council to consider any kind of modifications, we'll, you know, we'll be coming forward with those. But it's still early in the process. So the personnel lines don't really reflect anything outside of the, uh, the standard for, for the exempt personnel, the 2% uh, COLAs. Um, and uh, you'll see that we've had um, in the expense section uh, really the largest single change is the uh, accounting and auditing number has dropped 
So it looks like we've um, gone down by, uh, yeah, it looks like it's gone down by a substantial amount, um, but that's actually just been moved to the finance department where we had talked about this at last year's budget meetings. Um, it's really a more appropriate place for the auditing costs to be uh, incurred in the finance department, not the mayor's office. So, um, that's why I don't know if you want to add anything else. Um, and um, not to speak for um, uh, the acting mayor, uh, Councilor McCarthy, in any way, but I think um, the approach with the mayor's office, knowing that it would be a transition, was to you know largely leave it intact at current levels and defer to the incoming administration in terms of how how, um, how Mayor Pangala would want to um, step up and otherwise appropriate uh, within the mayor's office. So it, it's largely been left intact except for transferring the auditing and accounting funds, which were not increased. It was just a one for one transfer to go over to the um, uh, the finance department budget. Thank you for that. That was going to be my first question, is was there any change as it was transferred? But you answered it right away. Uh, questions and comments? Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mayor. Great to see you up there. Um, the, you made two, two uh, hires today, uh, the constituent services, which I see on here, and then office of director. Just for clarity, uh, does office of director translate to chief of staff, or is this a different position? Or can you clarify what that is? Uh, so it's the position that formerly was executive secretary. We're changing the title to office okay. director just okay. to re reflect a, a modernization of the, of the responsibilities in the title. Okay. Um, and then just for my own curiosity, the, the, the mayor's salary from 155 57 down to 150 is that a function of the council just rounding when we made our motion? Um, that is the function of um, the the budget, or the FY23, there are two extra paydays technically, and so okay. that's not a reflection of what the actual salary is, it's a reflection of how much would need to be appropriated to ensure the full amount of um, pay for the employee during that uh, the, the payroll cycle. This year, uh, FY24 is exactly 52 weeks, so it will look in some instances um, that maybe salaries were decreased, they weren't decreased, it's just um, we have an even 52 weeks in FY24. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Also going. Thank you, Chair McLean, uh, to the mayor. Um, really exciting to see a younger, diverse staff. Um, and I do want to commend Julio for his good work, especially outreach within the community. And I'm hoping that that will be expanded on with Michael uh, working with him, I'm assuming. Um, I think that's one thing that we could do better at, is to be more present in some parts of the community that maybe don't feel that they were listened to as much. And uh, once again, uh, really exciting about the staff as it's comprised. Councilor stop. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to preempt you. No, I, I didn't, there wasn't a question, but I appreciate that. Yeah, a, a big shout out to, to Julio and Lori for um, for um, their contributions, and also I want to give you know acknowledgement to Jen Russell and Sarah Kale, who had previously been in the office uh, and had, had given a lot of um, I think positive service to our community over the years. I. Uh, will say that in terms of being out and about in the community, there is uh, certainly an intention on my part that we're going to have our staff out, uh, be engaging in uh, what we used to do, inspectional walkthroughs in areas. We'll work with the ward counselors on setting those up so that we're getting some, um, you know, getting some eyeballs out around to make sure that we're talking with people and, and being out and about in the community, not just at events, but also just, you know, checking up on places. And um, I want... Uh, I want to see Julio and and, uh, and Michael really engaged in that in that effort and leading it. Yeah. Councilor Stott. Thank you, Chair McLean. Um, nice to see Mr. Mayor sitting over there. Um, question for you on the expenses. Um, the contracted services line seems to be kind of flat year to year. I'm just curious if you have any details behind it. Um, Consulting, constituent services, public engagement initiatives, if you have, I may not know what last year some of that went towards or what any planning of it going forward. And also kind of along that vein, I'm wondering if there's like a bigger picture idea of how to deal with translation services in the city as a whole. 
Yeah, so we directed some ARPA funds towards uh, language access and translation and interpretation. A lot of the contracted services in the past have been used to pay for predominantly um, those types of services or to pay for our C click fix um, invoices because that's the system we use for constituent service requests um, and that's funded out of that item. Um, I don't have the specific breakdown with me, you know, right now in terms of what's what it's been used for more recently. But I think the largest buckets have been uh, our technology in the office, including C Click Fix, um, and then costs related to translation uh, and interpretation. I uh, I do want to make a, a, a larger effort at our uh, interpretive services at public meetings, including hopefully in partnership with the council at these meetings, um, and also expanding our our language translation of city documents, uh, essential information. Uh, and not just into Spanish, but also into Portuguese as the public schools are starting to uh, also step up their efforts to provide Spanish and Portuguese access for, for uh, critical school documents. I think this the city should be taking similar steps. Um, and really would love to grow uh, a responsibility in each department for having ownership of that work so that every department has it as part of their regular um, way of doing business. Thank you. It's good to see the translation services. Just one comment on that. I see it individually in department of the translation services and the cost, but it seems that it might be more efficient to have an overarching policy of translation services in use. Yes, yes. So it's creation of both the policy and then also the structure for funding it. The, I think the issue, for example, when we created the position of Latino Affairs Coordinator was um, they, they became the go-to for everybody that just needed something translated to Spanish. And that was not fair to them. It wasn't the intention of what that role was supposed to be providing. Um, and some departments used it more than others. And I think that having each department have ownership of that work and then have it be part of their practice. You know, we use Laserfiche to digitize documents. Um, as they're created, we should be able to have a, a similar policy for, you know, if you're generating a document for the public, what is your plan for providing it in Spanish? What is your plan for providing it in Portuguese? And it can't be Google Translate. Let the record show that Councillor Dominguez has joined us. Welcome, Councillor Dominguez. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been a member of the committee. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for great response. Uh, as you might know, I'm very interested in the last item on the translation aspect. My question to you, and, and I think you already say it, but I just want to make sure that I hear it right. You say you don't have exactly how much in the budget is being allocated for that item. Uh, I don't, I, there's, uh, I believe it was about 35,000 in ARPA last year that was directed towards it. And then a share of these, of the contracted and consulting services in the mayor's office is used for uh, translation as well. It seemed to be a little bit too low for professional translation, something that I think we are looking for to have quality of translation because one thing is translate without any professional knowledge and translation with professional knowledge. As you might know, we have so many Latin, Latin American countries that for any reason, one thing say one, thing, one, one different thing than another. So based on that, the professional translation need to be appropriate in a way that everybody understands exactly what, what is the meaning of, of what they're trying to translate. So any, any idea maybe in the future to increase and find some other resources so we can really have some good quality of translation? Yeah, I think if it's not in the regular budget, then there's opportunities through ARPA. Um, there's other funding sources to help bolster that. I would say that um, also not just relying on outside contractors to provide the translations, uh, to the extent that we can build capacity in our workforce uh, with native speakers of, of Spanish and Portuguese uh, is definitely something I would love to build on because that provides, I think, um, the, the greatest flexibility uh, and you know making it part of the of the job responsibilities for positions within the city not taking advantage of somebody's ability to speak English or in Spanish or, or Portuguese but um, you know I think people that are um, employees who are native speakers of those languages really I think have a high capacity to be able to uh, take projects on in a way that's very flexible and direct uh, and responsive to situations at hand. In terms of interpretive services, uh, the schools providing it at the school committee meetings is uh, expensive, but I think important. And like I said, I would like to have a conversation with the, with the council and with the clerk about, you know, are we able to start thinking about what it would take to have a similar program here um, for, for the public during these meetings. 
Councilor Marcello. Thank you, Chair. I have a few questions on the um, the text part of your budget. Oh, um, okay. I can't take much responsibility for this. But. I, I understand that. <laughs> and hopefully we can get a new set of goals from you. I think these are these could be updated, definitely. Um, but my question is, the, um, the Commonwealth Seaport Economic Advisory Council, did this governor, is, it, is that still a working council? And um, So this appears to be a copy-paste. I am not a member of the Commonwealth Seaport Economic Advisory Council. That was specific right. to um, the former Mayor Driscoll, which is appointed right. to that okay. council. And the same with the... Um, of the Salem Housing Authority. Correct. I'm not a member of the Housing Authority Board. Do we have a new, do you know if someone has been appointed yet by the governor? Uh, my understanding is there has been an appointment. Uh, I'm not sure where it stands in the confirmation process, so I don't know, want to speak out of school as to who it may be, uh, but I can find out and, and let the count, let the counselors yeah. know. Okay. But they All did right. identify somebody. I'll follow up on that. Thank you. Um, the Mayor's Homelessness Task Force, is that still going? Uh, well, I've been off in the in the building for about uh, six eight months hours. ago. So, uh, six as months of, ago, um, it, I don't believe it continued. It's just kind of been replaced by the high risk homeless task force, which is a I think a better place for it because those are the actual clinicians and providers that are mm -hmm. working with uh, and the outreach specialists that are working with those individuals. Yeah. Um, it, I think it, it brings a level of um, seriousness to the work, mm -hmm. but I, I think that it's not, not necessary when the high-risk task force is actually the ones doing doing or the ones actually doing the work um, yep. every day. So agreed. Yeah. I think you know an update on that page is, oh, I've, is I've many updates, really actually, necessary. Thank you, Councillor. If I may just take this opportunity to say, um, you know, this is an almost 900-page document, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's great that we provide this much detail and information mm -hmm. for people. It is, it is, there is a point where something that has so much information, it becomes inaccessible and, and not fully transparent. Um, so working with the, with the finance or the chief financial officer, one of my goals in the coming year is to think about next year's budget, having useful information, maybe um, fewer pages. Well, hold on. Right. Because I, you know, I think people go and read the text stuff and they start with the mayor's office. Yeah. So that's why I'm pointing this out, that you're the first section and that's where people are going to start. And mm -hmm. so I'm not suggesting that you make the text lighter because I think it's important to know what the goals were last year and what your new goals are. And I think that's important in looking at a budget. And that's what makes this a readable budget, right? Instead of just looking at numbers, which some people... Correct. They, yeah. they du freeze. So Duly noted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, anyways, okay. Mm -hmm. um, t there's, there's numbers, I'm, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm no, just like, yeah. it, anyways, okay. Yeah. No, no, not, no, if I could just say, it, it, it's also a directive from the GFOA, which is, you know, rate gives us our, our certification on the budget. Mm -hmm. They think that if it gets too long, that it gets too inaccessible to the public and their goal is to provide transparency. Okay. I don't think it's reducing the narratives. I think maybe there's, um, uh, there's, there's, um, there are sections with numbers that are repetitive and, do, you know, not necessary or that can be mi displayed in a, in a graphical format or a way that's reduces the size of the, of the document while making it more okay. accessible and readable to people. Okay. Yeah. Don't lose the words. We'll keep as many words okay. as we can. Um, there's, there's numbers missing for the new resident guides. Did we not send out new resident guides in the past two years? Uh, I guarantee you we did because okay. I, I assembled Just making them. sure. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why that's not filled in here, but... Um, All right. And are you going to continue the, the FYI Salem newsletter? Uh, we'll we'll be publishing a newsletter. We'll probably be changing the, the title of it. Uh, I mean, that's yeah. fine. I'm we'll assuming bring. that's with the news and announcements subscribers. Um, no, news and announcements are um, so. If you are signed up to for news and announcements, you are receiving an email every time something's posted on the homepage of the oh. website, Salem.com/news or SalemMA.gov/news. Um, that's a, a larger group than the people that have signed up for the newsletter in the past. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Council Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair McLean. Um, 
well, really appreciate some of the comments that uh, Council Marcillo said, but uh, I want to just follow up on two things. Um, Mayor, you brought up c -click Fix, and I do believe that we really need to tighten that up. You and I were part of the process when we first got the uh, software, and I feel there's a lot of people in the community who don't necessarily feel that when they make a report that it actually gets to the right place. And, and that may just be a matter of, of streamlining the process. Um, the other thing is to Councillor Dominguez's point, I do feel like translation is important, but I do want to make sure that when the opportunity arises that we think about ASL, you know, signing. Uh, this has come up at the uh, Disabilities Commission a few times. There may be some times where um, having a person who does sign translation would be appropriate. Noted. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Domingo, second time. Thank you, Chair. Chairman McLean. Uh, it's uh, a general question that I want to ask. I know you inherited most of the work that is being done for the budget. Have you seen any item that you worry about that is being uh, submitted that you think need to have some change so we can be aware of? Or you think everything that they give to you is already in good? Uh, I mean, so again, with like the full caveat that I've not had a lot of time, I, I, there were months and months of budget meetings with the department heads and with uh, the acting mayor and the finance team. I don't have the benefit of having participated in those. Um, I, I don't have any like great alarm bells at anything in this budget. I think we can have a conversation about some of the um, forward-looking challenges that I think we need to be cognizant of. Uh, when we have our school budget hearing, we'll have a conversation about you know what's gonna happen with the ESSER funded um, uh, positions and programs. Uh, we'll have a conversation about what's going to happen with ARPA down the road, uh, trying to be sustainable with that. Uh, the trash contract coming up, I think, is, is something that we're going to have to really be thoughtful about. Uh, and I know that the water and sewer rate study is kind of demonstrated that if we want to make sure that we're maintaining our, our infrastructure in a way that's uh, best serves everybody, that there's going to be some modifications to the rates down the road as well. So nothing that jumps out in this immediate budget. Uh, I think, like I said at the, at the top, uh, it's, it's a responsibly developed budget that I think is um, professionally developed and uh, continues the service levels that um, we strive to provide here in the city. So. Yeah, I understand that, that point, and I think uh, you're right, you don't have the time, and I think uh, we really appreciate uh, the finance department directors and the former mayor, the mayor who, and he all, his, his whole uh, entire team for doing a great job. My, my question is going targeting to your vision of what you think is going to be your administration. And I think uh, most of the time, even though uh, you inher inherited any information you you got your own that you bring it in and from day one you see something that is no that need to be changed and uh, but you answer it right so I don't want I don't want it to put you in the spot I understand that during the time you might be able to see more and be able to suggest any change yeah. but thank you for your response thank you thank you Councilor Dominguez second time Thank you, Mr. Chair. If there's no other questions or comments, I'm happy to make a motion. Um, um, I, I think that's appropriate. I just, I just do want to give the mayor an opportunity. Um, we will have specific time to discuss the CIP, but is there anything that you want to highlight in the context of relationships to what we're going to be approving right now? Um, not, nothing really specific. There's no CIP for the mayor's office. I think um, I mentioned at the, st at the start that you'll see there, that there, the previous uh, administration made a, a very intentional decision about how to fund some of the priorities. So you'll see more on short-term capital and less uh, in terms of, of heavy borrowing uh, and long-term debt. Um, and then really that placeholder for MSBA for the next phase of Salem High School is kind of the biggest, biggest piece of, uh, of new debt that we're looking at. Um, outside of that, you know, a lot of routine investments in water and sewer infrastructure upgrades, road and sidewalk improvements. Um, there's a significant amount of um, 
vehicle costs that are being incurred. Um, not so much more than normal, but I think enough that it's worth you know calling out in, in each of the department's meetings. Um, I think of the other major capital, some of the park projects. The, yeah, the, the pump stations for water and sewer, right? Yeah, the, the impact those will have on, on the rate ordinance. Okay. So. All right, so we'll get into those as they come. Thank you. Um, Councilor Hapworth, sorry to interrupt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the personnel budget in the amount of 449498 and the expenditures budget in the amount of 124400 Councilor Hapworth makes a motion to approve the mayor's personnel budget in the amount of 449498 and the expenditures budget in the amount of 124400 for a roll-up amount of 573898 Seconded by Councilor Merkel. All those in favor? Three plus my own. Matter carries. And we will move on to our human resources department. where all of those microphones were on and functional before you got here. <laughs> okay. We are, I always start with the number page. We are on page 560 if you like numbers, a couple pages earlier if you want the narrative. We are joined by our human resources director. Hi. You have the floor. How are you? <clears throat> Which one am I using here? Use the tall one. I have dueling mics. Good evening. Uh, Happy to be here. Um, thanks for this opportunity. I'm going to talk about my department and answer some questions about the budget. Um, I do know all of you, but for people either watching at home or just to be aware of what our department does, um, there are four of us. Myself is the director. I have a personnel assistant, Amy O'Keefe. I have a benefits manager, Jim, Tal Jim Taliadoros, and Alicia Brady, who is our office manager, slash I often call her my assistant because she sort of holds everything together. <clears throat> The part-time switchboard operator also falls under my department, and we also coordinate the, um, the volunteers to handle the switchboard as well when we don't have our part-time employee. And the department, um, you know, I like to say that while my department deals with the public, we sort of, my, my um, universe are all of our employees, right, from the start to finish. So, you know, we post positions, um, we, we do our, you know, schedule our interviews, and, you know, we hire full-time, part-time, the temporary staff, um, participate in negotiations, we administer the different collective bargaining agreements, we work very closely with the treasurer's office, as well as the finance department to make sure that people are paid correctly and accurately and in, in compliance with the collective bargaining agreements. And I interact with pretty much our department overall, interacts with every, pretty much every department in the city, of course. Um, we administer the workers' compensation insurance for the city and the schools. We administer and oversee the unemployment, um, unemployment compensation for the city as well as the school department. And we also oversee all of the health insurance, and that health insurance, life insurance, and dental, which are like the biggest pieces of the budget that we work. I feel like we work on it all year to try to keep those numbers down because that's a huge chunk of the budget. So that's um, pretty much an overview. I also have the honor and the privilege, I will tell you, to be the um, ADA coordinator, which means I am also the liaison to the Commission on Disabilities, which I think is just a terrific board. Um, there's nine of them, um, and Councillor Cohen is the city council liaison, and it's just a great group that is um, really committed to overseeing and advising and, and ensuring accessibility throughout the city. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I think this is actually a great transition point since we were having some conversations about translation and accessibility just a moment ago. So um, I, I would like to ask you 
questions in the similar vein as some we heard before, specifically related to educational training. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that number likewise is, is, is flat in your budget and that I'm sure it's, it's meant to cover a whole number of initiatives, not just uh, language accessibility. So I'm curious how, um, how the priority that we sort of heard from the mayor about, you know, it's great to have translation services, but it's also great to have people who can actually interact in the language you know, uh, integrated into our city services. Um, has there been uh, a push to to get that uh, instituted, both in terms of staff that we're bringing on? Are there increasing training opportunities for the staff we already have? Does that all run through you? Does it get sprinkled throughout the department budgets? How does that all get coordinated? So you can see I'm smiling because I'm really happy to talk about this. I invite you to come over to 98 Washington over on the third floor, the conference room. There's all the sheets that we have for our conversational Spanish classes that we're offering to employees. We're in our second round. Just so you can see that we really are pushing this. Um, this is our second round this fiscal year, and we'll extend that into the, um, it'll go through probably the middle of July, and we're going to kick off a third one as well. But So the internal pieces that we we had, I think, 12 or 15 um, employees go to an eight-week class, eight weeks, twice a week, over at 98. And like I said, why I want you to see it only is because the charts are on the wall. There's sections, you know, telling people, you know, tengo un fin de semana buena. There's all different sorts of phrases for people to learn. Um, so we're really trying to integrate that so that our employees can, you know, s break that barrier the minute somebody comes in there into their department who may not, you know, have English as their first language. Because, you know, just, I mean, I speak fluent Spanish and I can I know that if somebody comes in who doesn't speak speak um, English the, the minute the person the minute any one of us is trying to help that person the minute you say you know en que puede le ayudar a usted o que necesita algo como así what they the whole demeanor and everything changes. It breaks down that barrier. The, the, whole, the whole dynamic of the conversation changes. And then there's an effort on both sides to try to make it work. So yeah, we're firmly committed to that. In fact, the mayor-elect saw that the other day when he came over and we talked about additional um, you know, opportunities like this. So we're in our second one for this fiscal year. We had had one class before COVID and then it we finished that session right when COVID hit. So we had to, you know, no in-person classes, that sort of thing. We brought it back together. We're in the second session now and um, we're looking to do another session probably in the fall. Probably won't do much over the summer because I think the teachers actually go on vacation. And we're looking to do something for our Department of Public Services employees, and we're going to try to gear it to the different different departments. Right now, it is um, offered to you know nine employees here at City Hall proper, as well as um, 98 Community Life Center and library employees. Pretty much. Um, you know, all employees, um, and it's worked out really well. Friday, Wednesday mornings, 9 to 10.30, and um, Friday mornings, 9 to 10.30. Come by, check it out, it's pretty cool. Yeah, thank you for that. So is, is, this, a, is this sort of a, uh, a volunteer-based initiative, right, where you offer this to staff and they may choose to do it? Is there sort of an intentional, like, we want somebody from each department to participate in this? So I actually think it's a little bit of everything. So we had done it, um, like I said, before COVID, there was always an idea. I mean, at one point, you know, we were really, we weren't sure how we were going to handle it. I was like, we, we were trying to phonetically write out words so that people could just sort of get past some of the basics. I was like offering to do some of that, but um, it's a bigger commitment, right? So um, we had people volunteer and, you know, the first time, and then the second time we sent it out and there was a waiting list immediately. Um, and when Rahina came on board, our DEI director, Rahina Zaragoza, she, it, part of her um, interviews with people, there was um, a lot of interest in the ability for people to be able to speak Spanish. So there was a lot of um, interest, and it was sort of, I would say, employee-wide. I mean, it wasn't, you know, no, we didn't, I, I'm not aware of, and I don't think it happened, any type of, you know, you're going, or, you know, you need to go. I mean, there's collective efforts, like in our parking department, um, over the Community Life Center, it's, it's, it's pretty well spread out. And it is voluntary, but I mean, it was such a success and, the, and everyone's having fun. Like, I mean, I, I would go by the health department and instead of saying, hey, how are you guys? Or what's happening? It's like, I'd start talking Spanish to them right away. And, you know, they get, you know, sort of get excited about it and try to respond to me in Spanish. That's wonderful. Do you, do you have a sense based on our current pace, how long it might take for us to get to a point where, you know, Picking, picking on one community, Spanish speakers in our community might be able to access any given office and be likely to find somebody who can communicate with them in their own language. I mean, how long is it going to take us to get there? 
I, I might have to think about that for a minute. But uh, the, the effort is there, and um, the, the the way that uh, Victoria conducts the classes, as you know, she find, she sort of does a little bit of an inventory to find out, you know, what department everyone is from, and then gears like phrases and key keywords and things like that. Um, so, I mean, I know in the health department, you know, I, I had conversations with them the other day. I know over in our um, Park and Recreation, I spoke with Tiffany the other day, and I know she sent something out in Spanish to somebody. Um, I, I think it's going to vary per person and, and, and to what degree they continue to practice. But I, I think what's good is when you, have diff when you have more than one or two people in the department that are in the class, they can practice amongst each other. I, I don't, I don't know that I want to venture a guess on how long it would take for you know that to be a comfortable conversation. But I, I think, as I said before, too, just breaking down that little bit of a barrier makes all the difference in the world. Because then, the person who doesn't speak English and then the person who's trying to speak Spanish, sometimes they can sort of get through it. And then sometimes there's somebody in the office that can assist. But just starting with that dynamic makes really makes all the difference. I mean, I've seen it, and I've seen it now with the people that are learning to speak the smaller phrases. Thank you, Mayor. See if I can add to that. So it's actually it's it is a popular program. I tried to sign up for the class before the one session before COVID, and I didn't get in. Um, so it's a high high bar. Um, I think the other side of it is, is it's it helps these employees um, be a little better equipped uh, to interact with certain members of the public in a language of the, their preference or their choice or, or the only language they speak. It provides some degree of uh, understanding of a different culture, so they're able to interact with people with a little bit more comfort, I think, and uh, and ability. And it also, I think, importantly, is providing a really good social environment for the for the employees. It, like the. It, that's not the reason we do it, but I think that the side effect of it, of them getting to know other employees from other departments and other buildings and interacting with them in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise uh, really helps with morale. And so to, to Lisa's point, I think um, really hoping to identify other types of similar programs we might be able to offer employees where they are able to both have those kinds of um, morale lifting experiences and social environment, but also um, grow professionally and develop as in whatever their role is with the city as well. So. Thank you. Appreciate the emphasis on that. Um, before we start with our comments and questions, I will just note, um, as 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 a, as Director Camarada noted, we are going to go through sort of the administrative budget, and then we will also talk about workers' compensation, unemployment, group insurance. So, if we could keep our questions targeted to the section that we're talking about, so we can sort of keep it orderly, that would be appreciated. Okay, Council Marcillo. Thank you, Chair. Is there a uh, some sort of a principle, a guiding principle for new hires to prefer bilingual people to intentionally hire those that can speak other languages? Yes. Um, some of our job descriptions, bilingual applicants are encouraged to apply. It's also in, um, in the job description that will say, you know, the ability to speak Spanish or bilingual is preferred. Um, but I think we need to cast a wider net. Um, I, I think that, you know, I was talking with the mayor elect, I was going to say mayor elect, your mayor elect when I talked with you. <laughs> um, I just, I, I think that we might need to widen our net to attract um, people that speak more than one language. Okay, thank you. Councilor Merkel. Thank you, Chair McLean. And I, I just want to quickly say how much I appreciate these efforts. First of all, when you described what your department does, it was a very long list. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it, it does, I mean, it's super helpful to have someone who's fluent who can really assist someone. But with the Spanish, I personally stumble through when I greet people doing volunteer work. They just appreciate you trying. It just shows a level of respect uh, and connection. So I, I really get what you're saying, get what you're saying with that, and I really appreciate it. And also, um, to Mayor Pangalo's comment of when you have when you have an, uh, an event or, or an activity that brings different departments together, uh, it does create team building. Uh, like when I recently attended the North Shore CDC had the Faceless Dolls um, event and different people from other departments um, joined it. I got to know um, people from uh, other departments that I didn't know and it, you know, it was an opportunity to connect. So I appreciate any, anything of that nature going on as well. I think it's really helpful. And thank Thank you for those efforts. Councillor Stott. 
thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for me as well for all that you do and your team. Um, one question I had, well, two questions I had around training. I noticed that you have four goals for the DEI training for 23 and 25, 24. Um, are you assisting Rahina with organizing them? Is, is that the training number there? Yes, so the um, seven. Oh, yeah, so um, initially the citywide trainings that, that she did, those are coordinated with Rahina as well as my department. Alicia, we, you know, we had a, a huge sheet of all employees and tried to sort of plug. So we didn't have just one whole department at a time. We mixed everybody up. And then now with new hires, it'll be quarterly. Um, so I put in six, but, you know, if something comes up or some, there's something arises unexpected, you know, I put a little bit of a cushion in there. But those will be coordinated through my department. Thank you, and um, a follow-up question to all of those trainings that we were just talking about, or more conversational trainings. There's no line item in your budget for that, so is that something that is being done, or is there, and I missed it. Um, I did notice there was an increase of the educational training. I didn't know if that was part of it. Like, or It sounded like there's a member of your staff that might be providing some of the training or help, or is it outsourced and contracted? So the, it does fall into the education line. Um, we do, you'll notice my expense line is, is, is um, level funded. We try to run pretty lean and mean. We make our own envelopes. You know, we make our own labels for the envelopes and don't order stationery, things like that. But um, the education that, that paid for it the first time, and it, it, it wasn't a, it's not a heavy lift. It wasn't thousands and thousands. I think that we can live within that. For the, for the Spanish classes as well as, you know, the, the notebooks that we purchased and some of the supplies, um, it's worked. Thank you. Councilor Dominguez. Thank you, Chairman Glenn. Uh, I had to say something about this. Uh, I really, really appreciate that. I see uh, how the new and past administration are working very, very hard on bringing the uh, Latino community on board and in so many aspects. I can say by the police department and by the department, the new members and the, the numbers that we have for Latinos in, in the force and overall in the whole city is, is speak very loud and clear that it's been a big effort to do it. I hope, uh, and that's why I asked the mayor let he will continue, he want to continue with the same path of this what you propose because I think that need to be increased every year in order for us to see more resource because the population is growing and I think that everybody benefits when we integrate everybody in the same level and I see the effort and I command you you as a HR which I know you have so many others uh, Latino new and, and all in, 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 in you in your, in your department so I, I just want to encourage you to continue Continue to, to put attention to that because that's that's great. That's going to at the end going to pay off. I'm going to help everybody. So thank you so much. Thank you. Councilor Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair McLean. Um, yeah, I want to echo thanks and appreciation. I do, on a personal level, I want to say that without Jim, I would have no idea anything about benefits. Um, it seems really confusing and he's really good at simplifying it and walking people through it um, and I do want to commend you for your work um, as the ADA compliance person and and to the Disabilities Commission I know uh, Councillor Stott served in the in, as a liaison as well you know as we talk about diversity of our community um, we don't always appreciate the diversity um, of people with disabilities um, it's not just people who use wheelchairs or people who have, you know, challenges with sight. Uh, there's a whole, um, you know, it's very varied. And I think right now the, the commission is, is represented much better than it used to be. So I want to commend you for that and the work that you do with the ADA work. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to remind you, though, on Friday morning um, or Wednesday morning, feel free to pop over to 98 between 9 and 
Um, on Wednesdays, I just want to go back to the Spanish class because I really am passionate about that because I've seen the changes with employees. Um, she does a lot of, you know, grammar and sentence structure and, and that sort of thing on um, on Wednesdays. But what she does on Fridays, she starts it off a little bit of culture and she brings in a few different guest speakers. Um, I spoke to them once. I mean, I introduced them, you know, the first day anyway, but I went in and spoke of, like my, my time when I worked in Lawrence all that time and the difference, the different culture. And so feel free to pop in. I, I think she'd be very happy to see any one of you. I don't see anybody further with questions or comments. I, I think I would like to give the opportunity. Um, I didn't. I didn't notice any human resource specific capital uh, project numbers. If I'm wrong about that, please correct me. But um, as we are clearly having a conversation about access and ADA, I just wonder if there's anything else within the CIP that you would want to highlight in your capacity as the ADA coordinator that you sort of have seen sprinkled out there. Um, I know there's some improvements coming at the library. I don't know if there's any other items akin to that that you'd be interested in speaking to. So I think um, I would comment that um, in, in a, like, you know, we have the ADA transition plan that we, um, a couple years ago, I'm losing track of time here, um, but now what, what, it's a living document, right? When we did that, it was a big undertaking, um, but I think what it showed us was the place where we were deficient in certain areas, right? So um, I do know that departments have sort of have it like sort of baked in the cake now, like focusing on accessibility. So I don't have a particular line item in my budget for that, but I do know as projects are funded and, and different um, activities in the departments on what they're doing, it's, it's built in there. Thank you. Okay, seeing nothing further, I'll accept a motion. Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the department uh, personnel total of 555 813 and the expenditures total of 31800 for a grand total of 587 613 Councilor Hapworth moves to accept the Human Resources Department personnel budget in the amount of 555813 and the expenditures budget in the amount of 31800 for a sum of $587,613, seconded by Councilor Stott. All those in favor? Three plus my own, the matter carries. Thank you. We will move on to workers' compensation. So as I mentioned earlier, just I can just give a brief overview. Um, we have been insured with MIA, the Massachusetts Interlocal Insurance Association, since 2008 for our workers' compensation claims. Um, what's what's helpful with that is when, a, when when an employee is injured on on the job, we'll file. You know, we follow the claim, we, we we send it off to the insurance company, but we're not making that decision on the legitimacy of the claim. And I just I can't stress enough just on some of the. You know, there was a time we were self-insured for that, and with no deference to the past, it's just we're in a different time now, and it's just, it's really helpful to not be making those decisions, but to work with the insurance company, to follow the claim, to see if we can offer any type of light duty, that sort of thing. Um, we do have five claims that I call the pre-Maya tail claims, which is also part of this budget. We are still required to pay salaries on those claims, and that's why that's one of the line items as well in the workers' compensation budget. And we're also required to pay um, work, we call them workers' compensation medicals if there are any um, medical costs incurred for those um, five former employees. I mean, the biggest piece of this budget, I'll just, uh, we were just briefly talking, is the workers' compensation premium, which, you know, is a big number. Um, but the, the way it works is it's based on um, our estimated payrolls, but it also um, 
goes by your class your class code and the risk codes for different positions so it's more costly to insure say someone who climbs a tree or is working say in the water department than it is for a clerical employee and then what happens is is they take that number they put on it what's called the experience mod and that's based on three prior years and so if you've had a heavy year three years ago next year that will fall off and it just sort of tails on itself so you know we, we offer trainings for worker safety um, we do everything we can to try to get people back to work if there's any type of light duty because remember we budget for their salary we don't budget for premiums so we don't want that those payments for salary works comp salary coming from the insurance company to hopefully we'd like to keep those as low as we can and for a short amount of time as we can because again we don't budget for those and so those will affect us a few years down the road so if we can accommodate some type of light duty and maybe somebody can't lift more than 10 pounds, but that person can, you know, help us with maybe some trash pickup or answering the phone, that sort of thing. As long as we can work something through, we'll do that as well. Thank you. Um, looking at the descriptions here, I, believe, I, I think I understand your explanation about the premium. That, that makes fine sense to me. Um, I'm having less success digesting um, item 5111, the salary is full time. I'm, I'm a little bit confused by the way it's broken out between um, what was voted for fiscal year 2023 and the request for fiscal year 2024 and just the way those two lines are split out. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for that question. This is actually um, a formatting matter that we're working on to clean up for future iterations of the budget book where um, our accounting system, if you change even a punctuation mark in the description, determines it's a different item and gives it a separate line. And so we are working to find a way to make that a little cleaner for review because it can be confusing of why it's separated and because the date was changed. Uh, it looks like last year we might have missed updating the date. Uh, but since that was cleaned up this year, our accounting system thinks it's a new item. And so um, we're going to try to get that cleaned up for next year. Thank you for that. Councilor Dominguez. Thank you, Chair McLean, and thank you for uh, balancing this uh, so important item on the budget, compensation for the employees. And you mentioned that premium was the biggest item, was 706000 and only increased like 56. Yeah. Are you, I mean 50 something thousand, because it's seven, for the 2023 was 706, for, and some change, and for the proposed one is at only like 50 something thousand. Can you explain? Thank you, Councillor. So the, um, you are correct. The FY24 premium estimate that we've received from Maya is $760,000. We are able to back out some costs that um, would otherwise be incurred by the city. Um, first, we were able to back out, we get a 2.5% discount when we pay our bill early uh, within a certain amount of days from when we uh, receive the um, premium, premium invoice. And the second piece that has changed a bit, uh, quite a bit actually from last year is the allocation where we the school contributes a a portion towards the premium and we um, based on the amount that the school had budgeted overall for all of their insurance premiums we were able to increase their allocation going into next year uh, which was appropriate to do so because um, of recent history the um, and you might know better than I in terms of the allocation between city and school claims that has been uh, heavier on the school side. And so it seemed appropriate to push a bit more onto the school side that had not been adjusted in several years. And so that's why the actual increase on the city side is a little bit less than what you would otherwise be expecting going from 706,000 um, in FY23 to 760,000 next year. It's the um, early pay and also looking to the schools to contribute a bit more based on that um, claims experience, that history that um, uh, that Lisa was discussing, um, and they were able to accommodate that based on the number they gave me that they had increased on their end. Okay. 
Seeing no further comments or questions, I will accept a motion. Um, and just for extra clarity's sake, I know that there was some there there are some notes of salaries within the line items here. We're talking about money that we're paying out to employees that are their salaries, right? So these are not salary costs. We're not approving any personnel costs within this. This is all expenditures. Councilor Hepworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I've got all these here. Uh, the, so I'd like to make a motion to approve the workers' comp expenditures total in the amount of 556660 The uh, unemployment compensation expenditures total in the amount of 200000 Let's just do, let's just let's do, do one the, at a time. Yeah, let's do one at a time because right. we didn't discuss the other ones. Um, Councilor Hapworth makes a motion to approve the workers' compensation expenditures budget amount of $556,660. Seconded by Councilor Stott. All those in favor? Three plus my own. The matter carries. And now we will move on to unemployment and group insurances. Unemployment first. Unemployment compensation. So this number is actually a little lower this year. Yes, that's not a, that's not a typo. It's actually lower. Um, we're just not seeing the trends that we've seen. So I thought it was it would be a smart move to just you know we thought it would be to collectively. I spoke with Anna and it just it made some sense to drop that number a little bit because we're just not seeing the trends. Um, you know, a few years ago we saw you know unemployment claims like I'd never seen before. One year I came back to the council asking for I think it was over a hundred thousand dollars because the you know we had just so so many claims. Um, we just don't have them. Um, the one thing we are seeing is, um, and I might have reached out to some of you either recently or, or in the recent past on fraudulent claims, we still, we still process those. Um, it's just happening everywhere. Massachusetts has the highest number right now. We don't pay for those. I'm just letting you know that that's also sort of on the landscape, but um, we're just not seeing the trend. And you know, we're working with the school department. I have a meeting with the school department tomorrow to talk about reasonable assurance letters, because this is also the time of the year where the non-renewal letters go out. And so if a teacher or someone at the school department is let go on non-renewal, they can apply for unemployment and they'll likely be eligible. But the also the other piece that's very important is um, the reasonable assurance letters. So we're working closely with the school department to make sure that we have all those in place and that we'll be able to keep track if any claim is filed. And you know, it's meritless because they have reasonable assurance. Okay. Um, you're right. This is a big drop. It was very noticeable. I was not expecting to see a 20% drop in this budget line item at all. Um, you, you noted in passing just now that a few years ago you saw unemployment claims like you wouldn't believe. I think we all kind of remember COVID and the great resignation and all that happened. Is, is part of this reduction sort of a return to baseline, right? We're only looking a year back. Was there sort of a spike and part of the reduction is getting back more towards what historically would have happened? Yeah, I think that and I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, and I also think that, um, you know, the people are finding employment, even if they are not renewed, perhaps at the school department. And I, I will tell you that within the last five or six years, we really tightened up that process of reasonable assurance letters and making sure that we're all on the same page with that, and so we could keep track of things. So I would say a lot of things would probably contribute to that. Communication is probably one of them, one of the biggest ones. Because most of our claims, you know, I think we've done the math. I think we're at, yeah, 90% around the school, from the school side of the house, and 10% are on the city side. So, like I said, we, we still administer them on both, on both sides, so we stay on top of them. Love seeing budget numbers go down. Just warms my heart. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, any other comments or questions from the council? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, unemployment compensation expenditures total in the amount of 200000 Councilor Hapworth makes a motion to approve the unemployment compensation expenditures amount of $200,000. Seconded by Councilor Marco. All those in favor? Three plus my own. So approved. On to group insurance. I love talking about insurance. I know it's kind of silly, but I do. 
I do. I find it really fascinating. Um, so we are, we've been with the GIC, the Group Insurance Commission, um, since 2012. We've had different um, public employee committee agreements over the years, and we've um, determined that it was in our best interest for the city as well as our employees <clears throat> to just stay with the GIC. They offer a whole host of plans. They're affordable. Um, the coverage is, is excellent. Um, I think that people appreciate being able to choose a plan that you know meets their needs as opposed to having a one size fits all because sometimes that premium might be a lot higher for you know someone who doesn't use healthcare facilities as much as someone else who does. So this gives people an opportunity to choose a plan, um, and usually the size of the network determines the the cost of the premium, right? So people have an opportunity to make some choices. Um, this is July first. This fiscal year will be the start of our um, third or fourth contract with the GIC for two years. We did actually do our due diligence and um, go out to bid to see if any other carrier was out there. And we did have some responses, but they were higher than what we'd be paying now. So we decided to um, stay where we were. That made more sense. Um, and that's where we are. The GIC made some, had a few little hiccups. I, you know, it was, it, we knew things like this were coming. Um, they did merge a few of their plans and they've sort of consolidated a few things, but we did some heavy educational um, sessions out there. We went out on site to the police department, the fire um, department. We had a few, went over to the library, we went over to the school department and had some inter, you know, in-house sessions here to explain to people you know, what will happen if you do something, what will happen if you don't do something. Um, and. You know, I, I think people are comfortable being able to make a decision for their health care. Thank you. I, I appreciate hearing that you went out and did some educational se sessions. Yes. There have been some significant changes in the insurance landscape in Massachusetts, and coverage has definitely changed for a number yes. of people. So I think that was an important thing to do, and I'm, I'm appreciative of hearing Thank that. You. Um, can you speak specifically to the opt-out program line item in the budget, um, which is decreasing fairly significantly. Yeah, so this is something we actually promote and I, I, I wish you know, that, that more people would take advantage of it, right? So when we do these educational sessions and you know, um, the opt-out program allows a, an employee who's been on one of our health plans for at least one year to then opt out and we offer a cash incentive for that and it goes for two years. So if you opt out of a family plan, it's $6,000, paid out over two years, 1,500, 1,500, and then 15, so yeah, four payments of 1,500. Um, and if you opt out of, out of an individual plan, it's $2,400 and that's broken out over the course of two years. Um, you know, it, it was, it was well um, received, people were happy about it, but we just, I, I, we, we tell people about it, you know, we, we especially during open enrollment, I say, don't, you know, at the bottom of my, you know, three-page email saying, you know, don't forget we have the opt-out program. Um, it just doesn't seem to have the draw. So I don't know if that tells me that our coverage actually is more affordable and better than perhaps somebody can obtain from a different, fa from another family member, um, or it's just, it's a comfort factor to stay where we are. Uh, we do promote it. Um, sometimes somebody will, you know, come in and say, you know, I have coverage, I got it through my spouse, and don't even know about the opt-out, but like, you know, we, of course we want to let them know, because what you don't want is to, them to find out eight months later, hey, I was available, for, you know, I was eligible for an opt-out program, so we'll, we'll do it then, but it doesn't seem to have the draw that it did in the beginning, and, you know, it's not for lack of trying. I mean, it's, we, we also, um, just as, as similar to that, we offer reimbursements for in and out patient co-pays, as well as, um, high-tech imaging payments, and I, I, as much as we try, I mean, I think some of my, my, my fellow count, my counselors here are, my, are, are aware of it, right? We, we certainly try to get the word out to people. There are some benefits that we do offer that um, just don't seem to make the forefront. Those rebate numbers you mentioned for specific services, are, are those included in this opt-out number? Is that separate? <laughs> Yeah, it's actually just part of the overall health insurance number, um, and that's it's part of that. It's not part of the opt out. Okay, and so this number really represents money that we've made available to staff who may choose to opt out, essentially to incentivize this, them to opt out. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm curious how that. I mean, 
it's it, we're talking about the money, but I'm curious how that interacts with the state requirement to have insurance. I wonder if that's a reason why more people don't take it up because they have to have the insurance. Well, right, and if, if you have insurance with us, um, we're not even able to unenroll somebody unless we can provide proof that they have coverage someplace else. So we require that piece as well. Okay, thank you. Council Cohen. Thank you, Chair McLean. Um, yeah, I was at one of the educational meetings. It was really great. Um, yeah. It was interesting to see uh, former Councilor Matt Vino do the GIC version for an hour and whatever. Um, and I do want to commend the GIC. This year's offerings are terrific. I mean, they've added some coverages that I know for me personally um, are things that I had in my previous insurance that I was hoping to have. So I think it's really um, robust in, in what's offered and what people can take advantage of based on their circumstances. Thank you. Councilor Prasniewski. I'm a big fan of Lisa. <laughs> I've been uh, employed by the city for many, many years, and sometimes um, talking insurance is sometimes talking a different language. And if there's one thing I know, it's Lisa understands, and she Thank speaks you. the language incredibly well. She knows how to navigate this system really good. My, my only comment is if anybody has any questions about uh, health insurance and what's best for them, um, Lisa goes above and beyond to make sure that uh, people know what, what, what exactly yeah. uh, they what exactly is the best plan for them. So, again, once again, Lisa, thank you for all you've done for everybody in Salem. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. I like it. Councilor Dominguez. Thank you, Chair McLean. Uh, my, my question is uh, on the compar comparison on other companies and other cities and town. They're using different uh, companies, I, um, I imagine that we have, we just, 1984, I mean, in 2023, we had a new company called AEI, AE, that's what it is. What's the name of the company now that we're using? The carrier? Who is the one that provided the... We're talking about, I'm not sure. The insurance. Name. What is the insurance company that provides? So the health, so the health, the city, our health insurance is provided through the Group Insurance Commission. That's the state agency. I usually call that the umbrella. Yeah. And all the different pieces underneath are Fallon. Well, it doesn't have Fallon anymore. Tufts. No, not Tufts anymore either. <laughs> um, um, Unicare, MGB, um, Harvard, and I'm missing one. I can't hear. No, we don't have Van. No. You're talking health insurance? I'm sorry, health, like health insurance or life insurance? Health insurance. Yep, so it, we're with the Group Insurance Commission. They've got several plans. Our, our contract is with the GIC, and then through them, we offer the different plans. Okay, and my question is regarding to, we recently moved to GIC, like, like you say right here, since Two April 30th, 2023, and we see the number increase on enrollment. That's what you say right here on the book. Significant budget and staffing change on page 570 at the beginning of the employee right. insurance. Right, as benefits. of April 30th, we had 1,800. Is that one under the significant budget and staffing changes? Yeah, that yes. means we had a lower number before. Well, and now we had a significant increase. No, this is the amount of people that are enrolled in our health insurance plans. I understand, so, but I mean, it was lower than that before, before we joined the CIE. Um, no, I mean, that number is almost a, this 855. Yeah. It's funny because I looked at last year's. Um, so I, when I wrote this on April 30th, um, that was the amount of people that we had. That's who we had um, paid for on our GIC bill. I actually looked at last May and this current year, and maybe there's a swing of maybe five or ten, five or ten bodies, whether they're employees or retirees. So this, encover this encompasses all employees and retirees. But when I say as of April 30th, that's when I wrote this. Oh, I wasn't the impression that the numbers or enrollees increase because we switch from company to another company. Oh no, no, no. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no. We've been with the GIC since 2012. It was just that I was trying to point out that we had 1,855 enrollees, and that's just 
subscribers, that doesn't mean you know family members and the amount of lives that, and, and, and bodies that we're covering. And then I just broke it out by um, you know school department and that sort of thing. All right, I understand. So I, I, my, my question is not really uh, an effect anymore because I thought that we had an increase in enrollment because we made some change. Oh but yeah, no, it seems pretty consistent. Um, when I look, like I said, when I looked at. Um, just to, to before I came here tonight to see if there was any change from the April enrollment to May, there's a very small swing, and it's still always been up over 1,800 people. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I would I would hope that it would stay fairly consistent. I think I think we've heard noted a few times that there was an effort to sort of maintain the full time equivalency of, of staff. Mm -hmm at the city level, and so I would hope that that would be reflected in the numbers of enrollees in, in our insurance as well. Um, I, I will say I'm, I'm grateful to hear that you did your due diligence and went out to bid and, and made an informed decision to stick with the GIC. Um, always a good idea, especially given the situation that we exist in now where our healthcare costs continue to escalate. Um, I do want to put in a little plug, it's not totally a question, but um, I do think it's important to, along with that, keep keep a close eye on exactly what is being offered. Um, mm -hmm. I myself am not uh, enrolled in the city of Salem's GIC coverage, but I am enrolled in GIC coverage through a spouse. And some of the changes that w occurred in the marketplace really impacted our coverage in some really negative ways. And so I, I just want to make sure that we are being careful about paying attention to some of the things we often discuss in these chambers relative to mental health care, relative to support of our queer community, and making sure that we're providing people sort of the coverage that they need for their health, and making sure that we're keeping a floor under what is actually available to our city employees, even if that may mean having to make some, some tough choices about the ultimate number that we pay to do that. Uh, but I do appreciate you doing your due diligence. I'm sure that you're paying attention to it. Well, I think it's important, you know, you, healthcare, I mean, if there's one thing I really learned when we moved from, um, we were with Maya um, back in 2000, but prior to that, was that this is, you know, this is, this is number one. You know, people want to make sure they can go to their doctor and they're covered and, you know, what is the copay? Is my what does tiering mean? All of that stuff can be, you know, it can be a little frightening, but, you know, once you sort of just break it down in pieces and you explain it, I, I think that goes a long way. And the other thing that we do all with, because we have our workers' compensation insurance with Maya, we also have um, an employee assistance program. And so, you know, we, we also put that information out to people, you know, on a regular basis. And that's offered free of charge to employees 24-7, 365 days a year for employees and their household members. Also, you know, that just, it, and that touches on just pretty much everything. It doesn't have to be like healthcare. It can be, you know, you said like mental health or, or things going on, even like family, anything. There's coverage for that, and it doesn't cost them anything. The first, I think the first three visits or consults on the phone, or if they do even in person, um, are of no cost, and then they'll actually assist the employee with a local provider. That's excellent. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll take a motion. Councilor Hapworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion to approve the employee insurance benefits total in the amount of $16,949,561. Well, I wish that was 1000 Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> $16,949,561. Uh, Councilor Hopworth makes a motion to approve the employee insurance benefit expenditure number of $16,949,561, seconded by Councilor Stott. All those in favor? Three plus my own, the matter carries. Thank you so much for walking through all of that with us. Appreciate it. Asu <laughs> Orden. It means thank you as well. But I want to see some of you at our Spanish classes. So, um, is everybody okay to move on? Do we need any sort of <laughs> biological recess? <laughs> We will next hear from our police department. Cool. 
I did it. Let's take a let's take a three minute recess. Anybody? Three minute recess. We are back. I think the feed is picking up. There we go. All right. And we have public safety coming up, starting with our police department. Uh, Chief Miller, you have the floor. Thank you. I'd like to start, uh, as others have, with the mission of the Salem Police Department, which is to protect the people of Salem and its visitors and to fairly uphold the law. Uh, we can get into all the ways that we do that a little bit later. Um, I bring to you tonight a raft of good news and one piece, the requested increase, that will be rather bitter. Salem Police Department has had a number of accomplishments that I'd like to highlight. In my mind, the two most important measures of a department are actual public safety and the quality of the service that the department provides. One big measure of public safety is the crime rate, and it is significantly down for the second year in a row. One measure of our ability to deliver, to deliver timely, quality service is our personnel count. And I'm very happy to report for the first time since my appointment as chief, the Salem Police Department is at full complement of personnel. For a significant portion of the past two years, we've been down as many as 15 officers. Running the department with a reduced workforce presents a number of challenges with which I'm sure you're familiar from all the times that I have had to explain shortfalls to this committee or this council by saying, I'm sorry, I just don't have the personnel to do that. As I've explained, one of the most principal obligations of a police department is to answer 911 calls. That's the way people still call for help in our modern society. And we have to have the personnel to respond to people who need help. The minimum manning to do that between frontline officers, dispatchers, patrol officers, officers in charge, and schedulers eats up the majority of department personnel. If you add the support staff for just that function of the department, there are precious few left for community outreach, dedicated traffic enforcement, criminal investigations, event planning, dogs, bicycles, recruitment, continuing education for our officers, and other absolutely necessary forms of enrichment and training. Having the benefit of the number of officers that was determined in the last personnel study, which was admittedly some time ago, will give us much more leeway to accomplish those tasks that I would describe as problem solving. That is tasks where we can address a problem more than we're addressing the symptoms. I'm also very proud to report to you that among the officers that I've hired to fill that, that gap in the last two years are eight Latino Latino officers and uh, five women. Uh, those two groups are not exclusive. Um, it's not controversial to say that a police department should represent the population it serves. And I will allow that we're not, let, not there yet, particularly not for women. But this is a clear indication that the Salem Police Department is moving in the right direction. In recognizing that the funding for the department is finite and represents a burden for Salem, I've continued my predecessor's quest for outside sources. We see, receive money from approximately 18 state and local grants that help fund everything from our 911 dispatchers, our ballistic vests, our body-worn cameras, and that's just to name a few. Last, tonight I want to highlight two other opportunities the department has enjoyed. Last year I was approached by Dr. Sarah Abbott, director of the Center for Crisis Response and Behavioral Health at William James College in Newton. Would the Salem Police like a scholarship for one of our officers to their graduate certificate program? Yes, yes we would. I'm very proud that Officer Neil Sicard of our Community Impact Unit along with our mental health clinician, Ben Morgan, completed over 150 hours of in-class study, 200 hours of independent study, and a rather grueling 24-hour training certification. I know I don't need to tell you that mental health crises drive a staggering number of our calls for help. Having Officer Sicard as our point man will improve our service. 
On a different public safety front, I was approached by some friends in the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Would the Salem police, like a dog trained to detect bombs and guns, along with officer training at no cost to Salem? Yes, yes we would. I'm very happy to tell you that Officer Keegan Stokes has completed a grueling 10-week program in Virginia and has returned to us with his new pardon partner, Madden. Madden is a very handsome black Labrador retriever. I will bring him to visit soon. I did not bring him tonight because I thought it would not be fair. I've spoken before about the partnership with the members of this council that I feel has made possible other department advancements. Body-worn cameras, a refreshed fleet of more efficient cruisers, improving our outdated radio system, the original creation of our mental health clinician program, and a hundred others. It is for that reason I'm hesitant to come with you, to you with as large a request as I am making tonight. But the truth is that it is for me unavoidable. Roughly 90% of the increase in my budget is due to the combination of contractual increases in pay and benefits from recent retroactive settlements, along with a return to full staffing. The remaining 2% is largely due to greater costs due to inflation. I'm going to pause here and try to answer your questions. Councilor Marcillo. Thank you, Chair. I have several. Um, you touched on the diversity figures for your new hires. Can you kind of wrap that up department-wide? I think so. And, and do you also have any sort of a comparison to state numbers also? Uh, approximate comparisons. Um, of, the, uh, of the 95 officers in Salem, uh, with those additions, 10 are women. Uh, that's about 10.42%. Um, and frankly, that's not enough. Uh, statewide is about 13%. Um, that does put us significantly ahead of some of our neighbors. Uh, the, uh, the best of our neighbors was Lynn, and they're ahead of us, ahead of us by about half a point. Um, but uh, I, I feel we can do better. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, of Latino, Latino officers, um, those hires put the Salem Police Department at approximately 16.7%. Um, that is, that's very close to a state average. Also much, much better than some of our neighbors, not nearly as, as good as some of our other neighbors. Um, a lot of it does depend on that local population from which to draw from. Um, uh, in fact, if you think that, uh, that that's much closer to the demographics in Salem than the demographics of women in Salem. Um, so, uh, but room for improvement on both numbers. But as I said, I, I believe a step in the right direction. Thank you. Um, what kind of outreach efforts are you doing for both? Um, I think I would describe our outreach efforts on two fronts. The first is, uh, you know, job fairs, colleges, community events, uh, all of which I try to send my recruiting uh, team to. Um, but the other is much more endemic. Right? If we imagine the, right, the, the tradition of people of Irish descent joining the police, particularly in New York City and Boston, right, that didn't come about because the police department did great recruiting in the Irish American community. It came about because people of Irish descent joined those departments and went home and told their friends and neighbors and relatives, hey, this is a great job. You should come join. Um, and that's something that I'm trying very hard to create within the Salem Police Department. Uh, I want members of, I want all members of the police department to know how valuable they are, but I particularly try to communicate to those, uh, those groups in the department where I'd like to see an increase uh, how, uh, how valuable they are. I try to shepherd their advancement through their department, uh, and I try to make sure that um, they're looked after. Thank you. Um, cameras for parks, you touched on that in your narrative in the, mm -hmm. in the budget. Is there any, any um, plans for cameras for specifically two parks that I know of, High Street Park and Castle Hill Park? Um, so we have, we've met with some problem in, as with so many other technological issues, uh, right, the pipeline slows us down a little bit. Um, but Castle Hill is in the pipeline. Um, 
and uh, I'm sorry, what was the other one you asked for? High Street. High Street. Uh, High Street is not in the pipeline, but uh, we do have money in this year's uh, money left over in this year in, in the current year's uh, capital improvement budget that could be devoted to that. Okay, yeah, they're both kind of hidden parks, and so that would be helpful. I, unfortunately, we're also coming up on time, uh, the, the time to replace some of the cameras we've repla we've installed in the past is coming due. So uh, it, it's there's sort of two fronts there, but uh, but I agree on both those parks. Is there any grant funding for things like that? Um, we have used port security grant money in the past. Um, generally, that's been more directed towards mm -hmm. the uh, ports, the port but uh, uh, where that can be um, horse traded, if you will, uh, we, we try. Okay, thank you. Um, the data that it was provided on page 593, um, unfortunately and disappointingly, there's no FY23 numbers provided. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, my, my page numbering is different. It starts okay. at one. Sure. Um, you're talking about the pie chart. Underneath the, that. Right. Yep, yep, yeah, the pie chart, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Um, yes. Uh, you know, 2023 is, uh, uh, it's difficult to provide consistent numbers because in some cases we're months behind. Um, but I can, I, can, I can give you a rough estimate if there's something you're curious about. Okay, I'm, I'm curious about um, traffic enforcement, citations um, and violations. Traffic enforcement, so I, one statistic that this doesn't show is the ratio of um, written warnings to citations. Uh, our, our written citations are coming up, even uh, with the dip that we've seen this year. So I see the amount of, uh, the amount of fines levied as increasing. Um, but I'm also happy to report that in 2023 it is on its way up as well. So I expect a, not a, not a huge increase, but a, a significant increase uh, over the 2022 numbers. In both, in both regards, in fines levied and in uh, actual citations written. So the citations have actually been going down since 2020, Yeah. the numbers here. Yes. But you're saying that these are just the fined citations and not necessarily the written warnings? Uh, I, I believe that number includes both, uh, in other words, those are all written instruments handed out, citations and written warnings. I think, uh, See, it says citation violations, mm -hmm. so that's including, uh, it's including all written violations. Uh, it, the, uh, it's slightly deceptive as far as the number of written citations okay. go. Okay, I got that. Okay. So wh what do you think the reason is for that drop over the past couple of years? Um, I, think there are, I think there are a number of chefs in that kitchen. Um, you know, I, I, I hesitate to simply blame the pandemic, but of course the pandemic had, had something to do with it. Officers were encouraged to only make contact where necessary. Um, the pandemic, in terms of law enforcement, in terms of traffic enforcement, has been over for a little while, and so we didn't see as much of an increase uh, as I would hope uh, mm -hmm. in there. Um, the traffic, my traffic unit, that is all those officers uh, permanently assigned to traffic enforcement has been low for a while. Um, uh, Dana Mazzola was planning on retiring when he was killed, but he was a member of that unit. Uh, and then Mike Levesque retired. That brought us down to from four uh, patrol, patrol officers to two. Um, Again, I'm happy to report that I assigned another in January, and I will be assigning another uh, probably next month, uh, okay. bringing, bringing us up to where we were in 2020. Thank uh, you. Or, or I should say before we were pre-pandemic. Okay. I had heard uh, one of your officers say that there's a monthly focus on enforcement. That's correct. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? I receive a report every month uh, compiled about all, the, uh, all of the car stops we do, all of the there's those written warnings we do and those citations we do and then a breakdown by officer. Oh, I, I interpreted it as this month we're going to focus on like people not wearing seatbelts or people uh, holding cell phones. That's or. a little different. So w we receive grant money to do some traffic enforcement uh -huh. and each month that uh, focus changes. So as you say, it might be distracted driving one month, it might be uh, failure to, to uh, yield to uh, um, 
Um, Pedestrians and crosswalks. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you ever publicize those numbers? We have not during my tenure. Is there a reason not to? Here's, here's where I'm coming from, and then you can think about it. There's always the... the I hear a lot that people don't see enforcement, mm -hmm. right? And it's certainly not reported in the, the newspaper to, I'm sure, to the level that it's, that it's done. I think it would be informative for people to know that this, this month's focus was seatbelt violations and this is how many, how many warnings we had to give out or whatever. I mean, I think that that shows that you're focusing on actual traffic enforcement, which I well, I too, I, too, have heard those complaints that yeah. there isn't enough enforcement. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the reasons for the, the transfers into that unit. Um, offhand, I certainly don't see a problem with that idea. I mean, it's not a, uh, it, it's not, we're not giving out the names of people who are stopped, so it's right. not a it's potential just numbers, violation yeah. of, of privacy. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm certainly okay. open to that suggestion. All Thank right. you. Um, let's see. Uh, the animal care and control, the asked for number was 13,000 and the budget is 7,000. That's correct. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, that number represents two different uh, purposes of that money. Some of that money goes to animals that come into custody of the police department, a stray dog, for mm -hmm. instance. Um, and then some of that money was going to uh, the care and feeding of those new police canines that we've, that we've received. Um, the care and the feeding of the canines and, and other other uh, equipment stuff uh, is uh, being taken care of by that uh, canine fund to which people have contributed money for uh, for, for the Salem Police's use in maintaining our own excuse, excuse me our own canines. Okay, so that that doesn't have anything to do with the animal control officer and. It doesn't, well, it, the I remaining mean, money from, is for use of the animal control officer in caring for those for those. Just animals. in caring yeah. for animals. Yeah. Okay. So my question is, is there, is there a budget or is there a budget item for education programs by the animal control officer? Specifically, um, we have a coyote problem right now, and I know that he's put up posters, but it's not enough. I think that um, the whole feeding of wildlife, we, we need a whole campaign around that. Um, so the, um, I, I think the posters and such that the, the animal control officer do come out of the regular printing costs of the police department. Um, the uh, education around coyotes, I think, is important, and, and uh, we've you know we've employed an additional uh, person, Daniel Pruel, uh, specifically in regard to the coyotes, and he's been doing a number of uh, um, well events, encounters with people and groups to uh, to kind of try to educate people about it and to try to do something about the problem coyotes. Uh, uh, specifically uh, identifying the ones that are the real problems. He believes strongly that it's not simply coyotes, but that's, that some coyotes are much, much worse than others. Okay. Um, the wellness line item was zeroed out. What does that cover? Uh, that has to do with a wellness stipend that was eliminated as part of that new contract that I mentioned. Okay. And drones and um, the license plate reader yes. were zeroed out. Uh, those were transferred to the capital budget. Okay, thank you. Councilor Domingos. Thank you, Chair McLean. Thank you, Chief Lucas Miller, for being here. Thank you for dedication and work that you have done for the community. Uh, I have to say that I'm very impressed for the level of participation that you have, not only on, on one community, but in the entire city. And also, I have to personally thank you for, uh, you know, bringing the level of diversity and, and increase the level of diversity in, in the forest, which is very important. I think that reflect on who we are here in Salem. Uh, my question, I have three questions to you. My first one is on on point building down in the point. I see that the utilization of the building is, is, is not really used to the 
level of capacity. You have any intention to go back to that side and try to create any type of program, especially now in summer time? So um, the the on point as a building is being transferred uh, to the school department um, as as sort of proprietorship. Um, the police department will maintain a presence there. Uh, I believe the school schools is planning on using it as a uh, parent orientation center, um, and so our SROs will have a presence there to participate in that orientation. Um, in addition, we have, we've kind of held out the ability to increase our presence there. Uh, previously, I'd said that, again, I, you know, I don't have the personnel, but now that I do have more personnel, uh, I can see uh, trying, to, trying to steal back an office there. Um, if Great. I would like to see something like that. The other thing I wanted to ask you is on bike patrol in the entire city, especially in some time? Are you, are you willing to bring that program back to? Oh, uh, very much so. So um, the, uh, the ways in which I'm, I'm increasing bicycle patrol, aside from, from uh, buying some more bicycles, uh, the SROs over the summer when they're not assigned to schools will be performing patrol on bicycles. Uh, last summer, again, due to personnel shortages, we had to put them in a, uh, in a regular uh, cruiser answering 911 jobs. This summer we have a little bit more leeway, uh, so they'll go, they'll go on to bikes. Uh, in addition, we've created two positions within the community impact unit. Uh, so these will be community these will be additional community impact officers, but they will perform their CIU duties from bicycle when the weather allows. I'm not going to make them ride ride around in February, but uh, for as long as the weather allows, they'll work a sort of a modified afternoon tour uh, on bicycles and, and doing doing but doing CIU uh, 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 responsibilities, um, and then. Uh, you know, when one of them is out, a member of C another member of CIU might backfill on a bicycle, and vice versa. You know, when, when in, in colder weather, when uh, a member of CIU is out, one of the bicycle officers might might fulfill their responsibilities. Um, so I hope it, you know, I hope it uh, improves the overall responsiveness of CIU, and at the same time, uh, you know, puts a lot more bicycles out there. Thank you. My, my I mean, the way I kind of direct my two questions kind of limit to the last one that I have. I know sometimes in some time increase the level of more active uh, police force in different areas of our city. I mean, it's not a secret that we have so many youth that they are at school and they, you know, they tend to be more active during some time. Based on the budget uh, total that you present here, do you, do you think that you have enough resources to uh, deal with any uh, unexpected situation that we might have, let's say uh, we have an increase of, of delinquency in, in one area. The budget that you've been uh, requesting is enough for you to cover any? Well. As I said, it, 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 for me, it's a dramatic increase in personnel, right, since I've been chief. Um, and so I'm very optimistic about our ability to do what we've been doing all along and, and do it even better with those more officers. Uh, are there eventualities, are there disturbances in Salem that, that, uh, that might, call, might be more than we can handle with a number of on-duty personnel? That is possible, but of course we have in place a, a very robust mutual aid and, and uh, uh, law enforcement council that is an MLEC system to assist us, you know, in a, in a spur of the moment event where we needed, where we needed more personnel. Um, if you're asking me in general, do I have enough personnel? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm always going to be tempted to say, no, I want more. Um, but, but let's see how well we can do at full staff and, and, uh, and, and we can, we can all talk about that, uh, uh, some other time. Thank you. Councilor Stott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chief, for coming in this evening and providing all the information, lots of data. Um, it's good to see the staffing is back up as needed. I just have a few questions. Um, a lot of them were already answered. Uh, my first question, and I may have missed this last year, so apologies if this is repetitive, but I noticed that the arms and ammunition line item was, uh, it looks like it was adjusted up fairly high for last year to 57,000 versus the 35 that was approved, and then that 35 that was approved was adjusted high 
away from the previous year of 18,000. So can you just explain that? That reflects those new hires. When an officer goes through the police academy, uh, it's very intensive as far as requiring ammunition. Uh, you know, typically an officer fires a certain number of rounds each year to requalify for in it with his firearms. Um, but when an officer goes to the academy, not surprisingly, he's got to fire many more uh, rounds in order to be trained. Uh, in those weapons. So that reflects the, the that personnel increase that we've had over the last two years. As I said, about 20 new officers total. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there a range on site at the station? There is a range on the third floor of the station. Um, it, it, uh, it, it is slightly limited in that uh, one, can, one can only use what they call frangible ammunition, which is lead-free um, ammunition that kind of explodes into dust when it hits its target, which is slightly more expensive than, um, than regular ammunition. It works very well for us for uh, sidearms. It doesn't work very well for us for uh, long arms, um, which is why we borrow a quarry once a year to do the qualifications there. Thank you. Um, a few questions moving back to the traffic and parking enforcement and the, the objectives there, along with the staffing that's there. So um, you keep saying transfers into the unit to level set back to four, but we're really just level setting to where we should have been. Correct, if we were that's, at four? That's correct. At, 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 uh, in in uh, uh, Fall of 2020, we were at four police officers and one lieutenant, which is where we will be next month. Mm -hmm. So we we're, have no plans of increasing that. We're standing I mean, at the I, floor. I'm not, I'm not foreclosing on the idea, um, but uh, you know, I, I, uh, I don't want to suggest that I'm experimenting with the police department, but I do like to do these, make these personnel changes, at least at a relatively slow pace, and look at the effect. Um, I was also curious with the, there were two lines in the objectives, the selective enforcement operations. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm assuming that that was the, the reference back to the um, monthly uh, I, topics. I, I believe so. But then there was a, another uh, line about a 59,000 municipal road safety grant, which will fund additional selective enforcement operations, pedestrian and bike safety education events, and the distribution of safety materials to pedestrians and cyclists. I was wondering how that, if that has been spent, and if there has been any, if there's any data around where that was utilized. I, I think the uh, the. There is both grant money to do that directed enforcement, and then we spend some regular department funds for that. Um, for instance, where we become aware that there's a that there's a, a problem that needs to be immediately addressed, there isn't necessarily grant money to do that, or the grant isn't necessarily directed at that. Um, so that's where we we might uh, we might use regular funds for. Okay. Um, my next question is: When will bike lane enforcement start? <laughs> bike lane enforcement. Um, would that be bicycles misbehaving in the bike lane or cars misbehaving I guess both, in the bike lane? Yes. Um, so obviously North Street is a hot topic, <laughs> but I think a large portion of that is both behaving correctly within it. But I will say as someone that walks, rides, and wheels down North Street on a daily basis, the there's zero enforcement of it that I have seen. So I'm curious if there's any data around citations for bike lane enforcement when it comes to vehicles parking in the bike lane, staying in the bike lane, or just blatantly ignoring the... So I think, um, I, I don't have any of those specific statistics with me. The uh, parking in the bike lane would be much more enforceable than, I mean, if so, if a car were to, how would a car on North Street get into the bike lane, like travel in the bike lane? Yep, happens all the time, and I yeah. see it every day, and I see patrol officers drive by, and they do not enforce, which I'm not saying that they need to be enforcing, but it's doubly frustrating, so I, I think it has to be a, um, perhaps a monthly quota or a, a uh, a selective enforcement operation, perhaps some education on all parties of the enforcement should be I, that should be done I'm, there. I'm happy to make it a, a selective enforcement. Um, uh, you know, we don't say quotas, right? We uh, a, 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 we'll say a productivity goal, but um, but uh, particularly as the weather gets warmer, that's uh, that's certainly something that can be added. Great. Yeah. 
I, my day job is sales, so I say quotas all the time. Um, I will also note that I have seen bike patrols um, around the city recently, so thank you for that. That's super exciting to see. Um, and I really hope, along with that, that the driving of the patrol cars down Essex Street pedestrian simmers down, because I think that, that I see that often, of the patrol cars driving down the pedestrian way. And I, again, I understand that it might happen, or it might be a necessity weather-wise, but I don't think it should be part of a regular patrol in a vehicle, in the, the um, patrol vehicle. Um, I'm much more appreciative. I th love seeing the bikes, seeing them out there, especially with the number of crowds that we're having walking down the pedestrian streets. Um, and then my last question kind of pinged off of a comment that you made about the school resource officers. Are those in your budget or are they in the school budget? Do you, I, do you I, know? I cover the school resource officers. You have a, do you know how many there are? Two. There are two. Well, well I should add. This year I added a sergeant, so he's not exclusively assigned as an SRO, but he is a he he can function as an SRO, and he functions as both a supervisor to them and a liaison to the school department. So there are two full time in the schools. That's correct. Are they pr primarily at a particular school? So or? one is assigned at all times to Collins, and the other floats. Sorry, I didn't hear Collins. And one is assigned to Collins at all times. So if there is one. Uh, he or she is assigned to Collins. The second one will then be assigned to Float. To Float. So one is assigned at all times to our middle school, 6th, yes. 7th, and 8th grades. That's correct. OK, thanks. Councilor Cohen. Thank you, Chair McLean, and thank you, Chief Miller. Um, I always have a concern that if we have a climate emergency, um, what happens to the equipment at that the, our first responders, police and fire, and your headquarters is under sea level, and so probably one of the more vulnerable spots in the city. Um, and I'm just, I'm not asking a question, I'm more suggesting that we uh, invest some time and discussion about a microgrid, which has been on the table before, so that uh, it's less of a, urgency if something happens, uh, that your equipment will be operational at all times, and we don't have to worry about flooding in the basement, and, uh, and that the we, we power... Don't, we, yeah. don't, we don't have a basement. <laughs> okay, flooding on the first floor, but the, uh, which would be your basement if we get a big enough flood, um, the, to make sure that we also have a sustainable power source whether it's solar or something else, so that the equipment for you and the fire department is is uh, doesn't go down in case the the power grid does. Councillor Varela. Thank you, Chair McLean, and thank you, Chief Miller, and. Mayor Pangala for being here tonight. Uh, my question was about uh, when it comes to community events and the heroin outreach. Um, this question directed through you guys. Um, I'm sure maybe, Mayor, you'd be able to answer this. When it comes to the allocation of abatement funds from the Johnson & Johnson case, I understand that uh, this year, uh, FY 2024 in the summer, will be allocated $60,000 and 87, 60,000, excuse me, $60,087. Is there uh, an intent to do more when it comes to harm reduction uh, with that money? So, uh, do you, um, the, uh, the settlement funds, or, um, have not been it hasn't been decided all where they're going and, and the current committee is currently meeting on a regular basis to, to make those decisions um, my ask of that committee and of those funds was to take over the funding of one of my retired officers who works as a uh, works as an outreach specialist uh, using, he was a former member of the Community Impact Unit, and uh, that was what he did there, and he kind of continued his work as a civilian uh, retired police officer. Um, and then he has been working hands in hands with, hand in hand with Healthy Streets uh, to do outreach. Um, what I asked for was that those funds cover his 
payment, um, but that they also fund a, an outreach worker who will be in the full-time employee of the police department. Um, and that's what that, that sum that you mentioned is. Um, we, uh, we haven't yet posted the job. We haven't, you know, it, 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 I only just got approval for that. Um, but uh, I don't think that would be the exclusive purview of the police department. I think uh, there's room for a lot of uh, uh, good actors in this, in this particular uh, front. Um, but I also think that, uh, as I've said in other respects, uh, the police department can't help but be involved. Uh, uh, in, in, in substance use disorder and, and the effects and, and the attempts to, uh, to help people. Uh, so having a dedicated member within the police department, I think, uh, is, a, is a good use of, the, of that money. Awesome. Happy to hear it. Thank you. Okay. Seeing nothing further, I will accept a motion. Councilor Appworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to mo make a motion to accept the personnel budget in the amount of eleven thousand eight forty. I'm sorry, eleven million eight forty six thousand one thirty three, and the expenditures in the amount of nine fifty seven oh ninety nine. Councilor Appworth makes a motion to accept the police personnel budget in the amount of eleven million dollars eight hundred and forty six thousand one hundred and thirty three and the expenditures in the amount of $957,099 for a total of $12,803,232. Seconded by Councilor Merkel. All those in favor? Three plus my own, that carries. Uh, Chief, is there anything that you wanted to highlight relative to the capital improvement program for the police department? To, to the uh, capital improvement program? Yeah. Um, there is something. I, you know, I, I, other communities have, have rather uh, vigorously discussed police appropriation of drones. And um, I thought it was something that I wanted to bring before the council. Uh, because I want to do this in as, in as most, in, I, I, I think it's a very good idea for us, but I want to do it in, in as transparent a way as possible. Um, I can talk a little bit about my purposes for them if you'd like, or, or I can answer questions first, depending on, uh, on how you you like. Just for people's reference, the police CIP is on page 359. If there's anything there you want to look at and ask about while we're talking about it. Um, any questions to what Chief Miller just raised in terms of the drones? Councilor Marcillo. Just to be clear, this is the equipment purchase? Is that the light in, light in That's correct. Okay. Um, the, uh, there are a number of applications for a police drone, and I think, uh, obviously, people's imagination conjures up the sort of the most intrusive. Um, I see primarily, the, re the reason why I most want a drone is to do searches for missing people. All right, if you imagine Salem's coastline um, with all its little coves, uh, it, it takes a great deal of time to search for, for, a, for a, missing, uh, a missing person. It can be done in a, in a much, much shorter time with a drone, particularly a drone outfitted with a, uh, a FLIR that is a, a heat signature camera. Um, so that's, I think that's the number one reason that I'd, I'd like to get one. Um, I recently fielded a phone call from the fire chief who asked if we had one um, so that he could look for brush fires during the very dry season that we've had. Um, and also a call from the DPW director uh, hoping to borrow one to inspect the water tower uh, rather than having to send somebody up to the top of it. So those are just a couple of examples of the sort of the nuts and bolts reasons why I'd like to have one. Um, but I, I, I don't want to sugarcoat that it does have more targeted law enforcement applications. One of them, um, and, and I know we've talked about this before, Salem and many other communities has a problem with uh, people riding scooters and, and scooter-like vehicles in irresponsible fashion. And uh, I've, I've been... Uh, I've told my police officers that they're not allowed to chase such people because the, the results of a chase could be much, much more uh, tragic than the, than the crime itself. Um, but putting a drone up in the air and seeing where they stop, seeing where they store their vehicles, seeing where they live, uh, I think um, 
as long as it's done in a responsible drone flying way, uh, could be a way to uh, to fight that particular problem. Uh, and that's, I know, something that other jurisdictions have done. So that's something I'm hoping to try. Um, and then finally, in the most sort of serious circumstance where you have somebody barricaded in a house, um, but you, you're... Uh, you can fly a drone inside rather than have an officer stick his head in or even send in a canine um, because, of course, the drone is much more expendable than either an officer or a dog. Uh, again, not going not gonna to be applicable in every circumstance, but it is a tool that I would like to have in my, uh, in my toolbox, so to speak. Hmm, counselor, stop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just had a question on the body-worn cameras. Do, are all of our surgeons outfitted with a body-worn camera, or will this get us up to a... Currently, every officer in the department, that is, every sworn officer, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, uh, has a body-worn camera. Um, there are certain assignments that don't aren't required to carry them at all times, uh, like our detective squad, our, our community uh, investigation division. Uh, but everybody has one, and everybody on patrol wears one. Um, the uh, the money that uh, the, the ongoing money is for the software necessary to uh, keep that in good order. Uh, some of the updates, some of the improvements, replacements when they get broken, um, and. Uh, some of the equipment that we use to trigger them. In other words, uh, I, I have a, bought a number of devices uh, that go on the outside of an officer's holster so that if he were to draw his gun and his body-worn camera weren't activated, it would automatically activate it, and actually those of the officers around him. Um, but we found that they weren't quite compatible with some of our holsters, so it required some additional equipment purchase. Uh, there's also similarly for tasers, right? When an officer uh, deploys, uh, takes out his taser and turns the taser on, it will turn on the, uh, the body-worn camera. Uh, some of the newer tasers uh, do that better, and uh, I thought it would be a, 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 a wise to buy a few more tasers so that more off, uh, patrol officers were deployed with tasers. So, so if I may, so the 105 is for equipment, and also it sounds like it might be something like going forward annual maintenance fees. That there have there to is pay. an annual maintenance cost. So yes. is that? Um, it, it's not as high as it is this year. As I said, there's some there's some uh, uh, specific equipment that we would like to have to go along with the tasers that isn't required to be replaced every year. But there will be a, a yearly there's a yearly licensing cost for the software uh, and regular, as I said, upkeep. These things do break, and when we hire new officers. Uh, Generally, we get as when we hired new officers this year, we had to buy more. Thank you. And if I may, I don't know if I missed the part about the evidence room. Is that an upgrade request? Um, so or? that is our evidence room. It's been a while since it's been upgraded, and um, you know the the uh, the evidence room is fine until it's not, and then when it's not, uh, it can have catastrophic effects on criminal cases, important criminal cases. Um, so uh, in my opinion, it's time we, uh, we renovated ours. Uh, the, uh, the, the, but that's not in the uh, capital budget. In, in, a, in another part of the, the budget, Anna, reminds me, um, are the lease of two new motorcycles that I, that I should alert you to. Um, right now, the uh, city owns four. Two of them are uh, outdated to the point that they don't even have anti-lock brakes. Um, I would like to replace those. Uh, so I think the, the, the most efficient way to do that is to lease them uh, for, uh, to, we have a three-year lease, I believe. Um, so the, uh, there's a, uh, is it a $15,000? $15,000 payment uh, that would represent the first of three to cover uh, two motorcycles. And maybe I misread. I thought that was zeroed out. Yeah, I don't think the mayor gave you that one. It, it was uh, it was moved over to the treasurer's department. The treasurer has the line for uh, leases, and so when we clarified uh, with the chief that it was to, it was a lease and not a purchase, uh, we moved it from uh, the police department's budget to the treasurer's office, and so I wanted to make sure it was mentioned now, since uh, she won't be able to speak to it in a substance of, a substantive manner when she presents her budget. Okay, thank you for that note. 
Um, just briefly on the drones, um, I would likewise expect that that purchase would also lead to ongoing some amount of ongoing maintenance costs and probably some training costs as well. I would assume there is. There's you know what uh, the the uh, uh, pilot license number one hundred seven, which is a drone pilot license, is has some uh, has some costs associated with it. Excuse me. Um, I do have three officers trained in that already for use when other departments bring their drones here. Um, but if, you know, I, again, talking about experimentation, I think it, it will remain to be seen how much mileage we get out of these drones figuratively um, and whether it, it's worth training more officers, whether it's worth buying a more elaborate drone. One can spend a lot of money on a drone. Um, the, ones, the ones I'm proposing are comparatively cheap. Um, and there are departments that have used them extraordinarily creatively. I was reading about a department out west that, that uh, any time that there's a 911 call, a drone goes to you know, 100 feet above the scene and immediately gives the officers a view of what's going on on the scene. Um, that's way, way beyond our capability, but uh, just imagining the spectrum of what a department could do with a drone, uh, there, is, there, is some, there is a lot of, of room there. Mm -hmm. And since we already have some officers trained in the use of this equipment, and I, I guess from, from what you're saying, you know, sometimes they're collaborating with other departments yep. who have the equipment already. Is there already a policy developed for use of that equipment in Salem that uh, you're using with your officers? So we are, we're writing the policy for our own drones. Um, we, we, we kind of adhere to that other department's policy when they have come to, uh, when they've come to Salem. Um, okay. You know, typically use of a drone requires two people. You've got to have somebody who's monitoring the drone. Uh, current FAA law requires the drone to be within sight, uh, literally eyesight at all times. Um, so then the officer, another, it takes another officer who's, who's looking at the, the screen that's showing what the drone is seeing uh, or perhaps manipulating the drone. Um, so really it's a two-man uh, uh, assignment. Um, the officers that I trained were really so that that department that sends somebody only needs to send one person and I can provide the second person. Mm -hmm. um, our policy is not finished yet, um, but it would certainly address things like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm specifically thinking about allowable uses and, and what people could expect it to, you know, what is the scope of use for the city if we, if we bring that kind of a Very, very much city. so. Yeah. Um, what are variable air volume rooftop units in your, um, in your those are uh, Those are uh, heating cooling units on the roof. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Straightforward. Councilor Marcello. Thank you, Chair. Um, so what, what nearby communities are to use drones? Tewksbury is the one that we most commonly borrow drones from. Are you basing your policy off of theirs, or um, we will certainly look to theirs to see what wisdom is is uh, uh, encapsulated. Um, I think uh, we'll also look to national uh, police organizations like Perf uh, to see if they have best practices. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also some common sense involved that mm -hmm. uh, needs to be uh, uh, codified. Sure. Um, what's the what's the cost of a drone? Um, the drones that I'm currently looking at uh, range from about two to about eight thousand okay. dollars. Um, so I, you know, I, I will look to get the best deal for the police department, but uh, I'm actually envisioning buying one two thousand dollar drone and one eight thousand dollar drone. Okay. Um, what else is in that equipment line item? The uh, uh, a uh, license plate reader. Are the cameras in that too? The park cameras? Or are they somewhere else? No. Yeah, I think uh, I think park cameras. So the park cameras were in previous in this in the current year's uh, capital improvement budget, mm -hmm. and we haven't spent all that money. Oh, okay. Um, so hence not in this uh, this budget. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm just very quickly let the record show that Councilor Hapworth is no longer with us. He exited about five minutes ago. Any other questions for the chief about the capital improvement aspect of the police budget? If not, thank you very much. Thank you all, as always.
of the generation. We're going to move on to fire. Dion, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Counselor. I know it's never fun to be on the trail end of these meetings, but here we are. I count myself lucky. I was enlightened. <laughs> so um, I'll begin by again saying thanks for, for um, hearing me out. I'd like to stop by just touching on a few areas uh, in the department that um, have really shown some improvement. Uh, unlike the police department, we too. We're deficient 15 bodies, and the chief and I started relatively around the same time. So we do, we're deficient 15 bodies, and then we dealt with the consequences of COVID, and a significant amount of people retired as well. So uh, in the last two and a half years, I have hired uh, 22 individuals, anticipating uh, four mandatory retirements this year, and two next year, I'm in the process of completing the hire of seven additional uh, reservists. So presently, we're fully staffed, but unfortunately, we're, we're not able to count them as we'd like until they complete the academy. And the way the academy works, uh, it's really hard to get positions there. So I'm happy to report the seven that are, the eight that are in the academy presently uh, graduating Friday. So Excellent. we are effectively fully staffed and fully manned. Um, and the manning part means we don't rely on overtime to fill those positions. And that brings a great relief. Um, as the chief had had to explain on several occasions, I've been in here looking for additional funding to cover overages for those reasons. So moving forward, it's my goal to maintain that reserve list indefinitely. Uh, with the anticipation of the mandatory retirements I explained uh, a minute ago, and then what we anticipate next year, I will be able to put a position, a body in that position as soon as the retirement happens. Uh, there'll be no lag time of interviews, background checks. The whole prior hiring process can take four months. Uh, and it's pretty rigorous and it takes, every step takes a long time. So I'm happy to, to be at the point I'm at. The, um, the, also the benefit of having a reserve list is the academy w would not allow us to reserve a, a an upcoming class, a position in an upcoming class, unless an employee was hired. And once they're hired, it could take six months to get them into a class, and that's absolutely ridiculous. So they've changed that rule now. So if they're on a reserve list and I can nail down a specific date that they'll be starting, they, they, allow, they now allow me to reserve a spot at the academy. So not only will they be coming in to fill that retirement spot, my goal is to get them to the academy within three to six weeks, which is fantastic. So we're not sitting them on the side of a truck, not really counting them as a firefighter until they're firefighter certified. So uh, the, the reserve list is tenfold. It's just amazing and I'm thrilled to be in that spot. So um, we're done with the reserve list. It's all completed. Um, it's certified. Uh, there's just a couple more dots uh, to, to nail down and it's teed across and we're good to go. So with Manning, uh, as the chief mentioned, fully staffed. Uh, it, it's just going to allow us to run the department more effectively and more efficiently. So that, that's one of the best landmarks that I've hit uh, since I started. Uh, when I came on board, I set some goals um, personally that I, I felt the department needed to reach. And I focused most of my energies on those goals. Um, they include modernization um, and then um, maintenance and 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 just repairs. Uh, I, I manage five buildings. I am a chief and a facilities manager. Um, we have five stations, and, and it's a big, big ask to, to maintain those buildings. Um, a lot of my efforts have been to doing exactly that. Um, we spent a lot of money on my first year. We remodeled the exterior of the Salem Fire Station headquarters. Uh, it's beautiful now. We have a, a little bit more landscaping to do on the Deland side now that their construction is done, and that building exterior is completely finished. Um, I also have a CDBC grant for the exterior of Station 5 along with the line in last year's capital budget. Uh, that project will be commencing, and if you walk by the sidewalks at Station 5, 
it, it's it's just treacherous. And so in, in the back entrance where the firefighters come in, the, the landing is like that. So all, all that's gonna be corrected. The, the ramp's all sunken in and so, so we're gonna remodel the entire exterior of that building. We're gonna replace overhead doors that are huge maintenance costs and install some appropriate man doors and the station will be as complete as station headquarters is now. Um, station four, we completed the exterior. The ramp was replaced. Uh, that was done through the city engineering department. We spent a good amount of money repairing the roof on station five and station four to the, to the uh, point where we're done with roofs, I hope. Um, the roofs has been my nemesis. Uh, it's just so much of an issue if you don't have a good roof. Uh, and then the station four was painted and um, one of our firefighters took the initiative to create a sign and, and it was hung on the building. I don't know if anybody's seen station four over on Essex Street. I'm pretty proud of it. They, it was all the direction of the firefighters that made it look that good. So all our stations are getting there and that's one of my goals. Um, the last and probably the, the, the toughest um, thing I'm reaching for is sustainability. We have a, a study that's underway with the city, as you guys, all, as you members all know, but it's, the buildings have been studied, we have our list, but what we need to do eventually, and I serve on the sustainability board, which I'm happy to do so, is take the next step, which we will, and, and start modernizing the interior, the heating, air conditioning, and electrical systems on these buildings. Um, we have boilers that are older than, than um, they just, older than me and, and I'm sure much older than that. Um, with steam radiators, uh, it, it, windows that you can put fingers through the cracks in the winter time and, and that's just ridiculous in some of the buildings and th that's what we're gonna get through the next step with the sustainability. Um, and I'm also going to apply uh, aggressively for the CDBC money to hopefully get some windows done at station four because they're the next building that needs windows. So that's my goal, modernize those, in, um, modernize those buildings and, and, and get them cleaned up. Uh, technology wise, uh, it wasn't mentioned earlier, but I'll bring it up. We are in the throes of our, our radio project. We have a four and a half million dollar radio modernization project. Police and fire have been working on myself with, with the police for over four and a half years. We're in procurement. Construction is starting and it, you'll, you'll start to see work at both police fire and our lo remote locations installing satellite dishes, towers in the works. And I hope to sit here by this time next year and reporting that the system is, is up and running. Fingers crossed. But that's a monumental um, event for the city to modernize this communication system. And it will eliminate our need to use Verizon copper lines, um, numerous repeater sites where we pay rent or, or locate items. And it, it's just a cost. Uh, overrun annually to, to maintain this antiquated equipment. Some of it was purchased in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it still has knobs and switches and tubes and it's just, we've, we've long seen its, its use long, long ago gone. So that's a big project that's underway, I'm happy to report, so technology wise. Uh, something we started last year and we finalized at the fire department was it linking our fire dispatch CAD system with the police CAD system and now we've gone so far as to put the displays out in the stations where the, you know, in the, the shows that we used to watch in the 70s and they had information on computers and they'd have all, uh, we just got it, so it's there. But it matters, it saves time. And the IT department did a study for me and I've always proclaimed that we, we don't save the time as many chiefs will tell you, racing to a call, you save the time getting out the door quicker. And it's time of in, uh, from the inception of the call to the dispatch of the vehicles, that, that was the low hanging fruit for me. I, I saw so much, wasted time in getting these calls to the department and then to the firefighters and dispatch. So we've eliminated, and this is a real number, almost three and a half to four minutes on every call. Uh, that's huge when someone's in cardiac arrest, all you got an incipient fire in the corner of a bedroom, that's, that's the world. And that's what technology has done. Um, and we're still working on the problem. The chief and I uh, sat with the ambulance company because we think we can do better getting even that done. And we came up with a solution of installing, and our IT department just completed it, ring down lines. So instead of having to hit a button and pick up the phone and ring and ring and ring and then pass along information, now it works as we pick up the phone, they pick up the phone, we're talking. And that was installed between Atlantic Ambulance, Salem Police Dispatch, and Salem Fire Dispatch. We're synonymous, we're one animal now, we just sit in three different locations. 
All this, again, I think will get us above that four minutes of time saved on dispatch. And, it, and you, you say, wow, it takes that much time. Sometimes it can take 10 minutes from call inception by every time everybody is properly notified. And I kind of like to, to make it known that the fire stations are, are strategically placed for a reason. They put them in four corners of the city because it matters. And we get there. And we get there faster than anybody because we're in the corner of the city and we're ready to go. If we're in, uh, if we're in our station, we're out the door less than a minute. And we're there, our, our response times after dispatch are less than three minutes on average. So the people are seeing us very, very quickly. And on the really difficult calls, those minutes make the difference. Um, so I'm proud of that. And then lastly, the, 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 the thing that I've been working for is the modernization of the equipment. Um, I'll touch on the apparatus last um, beginning. I'd like to start with the uh, EMS equipment. Through the, the funding of grants in ARPA, um, we wrote a lot of grants this year, and we got Lucas CPR machines. They automatically do CPR for people. Game changer. You get one of those on a person, the color comes back, they turn pink. Now you can just help breathe for them, and then the medics can get there and stop putting the drugs on board. We've had those machines on people for 40 minutes, and they've been conscious in the hospital after resuscitation. And that happened right, right near Councilor Cohen's house. Um, I don't know if you knew the call, but it was an amazing call, and, and we've had similar stories. So the equipment matters, and we have the best in that. We just replaced all our AEDs on the fire trucks. Um, now they now have um, displays, and our our guys are now trained to read the rhythms. And we never were, but at the EMT level, a lot of our guys are reading the rhythms, the, in particular the paramedics. But when the paramedics come in board from the Atlantic Company, they can see our display. They don't have to rip our equipment off and put theirs on and start working. It, it's again a time saver, and the machines are just very, very user friendly. So they're the, the greatest technology. Uh, as part of a grant. I am waiting to take delivery. There's a shortage of the equipment for AE 80, A80, 80 AEDs, which will eventually, hopefully by the summer, early fall, be distributed to public locations within the downtown of Salem. Uh, it might be restaurants. It could be city buildings that don't have an adequate amount, but we're, we'll be going to set up some... Um, uh, some conversations with the um, the public health department and my team, and we're going to pick some locations. Those AEDs will all be monitored by the internet, and we'll monitor them. We'll know the condition. If someone takes that out of the box and turns it on, it'll automatically dial 911. And they're novice. You don't need any training to use them. They'll they'll walk you through every step. So I can't see that that wouldn't be a huge benefit to the to the busiest parts of our community. So those are some of the technologies that I've, I've I mean the, the equipment that I've really worked hard, and the department has supported me in, in purchasing. So a lot of exciting things have happened and a lot more to come. Lastly, I'll speak to the note of apparatus. Uh, we're, we're within days of getting delivery of our new Engine 1. I have pictures of it. It's presently in Walpole at the dealer. They're finalizing installing a few more uh, pieces of equipment, including a radio. That truck will hopefully be on the streets within a month. Um, there has to be a training cycle related to the new equipment that the, the factory provides. We have been waiting for this truck almost 11 11 months longer than we thought we should have been, but with equipment shortages all due to COVID and all. And, and that truck will be a game changer. We can get rid of one of our trucks that's 27 years old. Uh, that truck is, should not have been 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 let to serve. Uh, our ladder truck, which we were here about seven months ago, uh, not even that, it was the night we set the tax base. We, um, that's on the assembly line. We've received pitches. It's being assembled as we speak, and I hope to have, um, my fingers crossed, we'll have that hopefully before haunted happenings. Um, at present, we did have a critical breakdown of our ladder over the winter, and it was out of service for two months, two and a half months, and we were using an old Boston ladder truck, uh, a Beverly ladder truck, on and on and on. We got our ladder truck back. Less than three weeks later, we had an engine failure. So inside of service, again, being repaired. It's only eight years old. Unfortunately, these things are what we have to deal with. And that's why we can't just rely on one ladder truck. And I thank the council for understanding that and allowing us to move ahead and purchase the second ladder truck. So presently, you'll see a Newberry ladder truck driving around the streets of Salem. Um, fortunately, we have good um, mutual aid agreements where we share everything. If they call me and I have an extra pump, they get it if they need something and they do the same for us. So it's just a good system that works, not just during fires where they send over manpower and so forth. So those are the items that I've been working on. And um, 
And I want to touch on something that just occurred to me. Um, I know that Lisa Camarada spoke about Spanish lessons for the city work as well. Our department, over the winter time, over um, five and a half months, we hired our own Spanish instructor and we held classes Thursday nights for the firefighters and we included Atlantic Ambulance uh, employees that wanted to take part. And we taught Spanish in the fire department. Um, and it was a huge success. And it was more situational Spanish. We didn't practice the conjugation of the verbs, although it's necessary and all. But it was just phraseology that would apply to the mission that we, we do, and it was hugely successful. Um, our hiring, as I mentioned, presently we're up to 11 Spanish speakers. That last group of eight that was at the, that are at the academy now, uh, two of them are his, uh, Hispanic Spanish speakers. Uh, one of them got an academy accommodation, which is incredibly rare. Um, we've we've hired some fantastic candidates, so I'm excited to see these guys walk across the stage on Friday afternoon. I get to hand them their diploma. They'll be on the trucks within a week, and um, and they are all a, a, a just they're awesome. They're they're a real real to our department and of this reserve list that we're just certifying there's two more Spanish speakers um, I'm going to anticipate a, a question when it comes to the females counselor um, we are deficient as well I, ha I have no explanation I have no answer um, Patty Kiel-Maffangeli just retired she was the longest serving in our department and one of the first female firefighters in the city of Salem, and it was tough to lose her, and prior to her retirement was Erin Griffin. Um, we had on the last list where we just hired uh, seven before the eight here, I had a candidate. She went through the entire process and withdrew before the PAT, and I called her three times and begged her to come in and give it another try, and, and she said, give me a call in a couple months. I wrote her a letter, tried it again, she's out. I, I couldn't get her. And then on this re reserve list process, I had another female, and she had chosen in another avenue with a different um, job. So I still asked her if she would like to consider going through the process and then she could always turn it down at that point and she, she, uh, she denied. So we're trying, there's a, a pattern in the state, I don't have an answer. I, I spoke, I, I go to the Essex County Fire Chiefs every, every month and I'm on the executive board for the State Fire Chiefs Association and that topic comes up regularly. We're far more deficient than we were even 10 years ago. There's just nothing happening in the fire service to encourage women. Um, so I'll jump ahead. In our capital budget, we are looking to fund the project, which I have designed on, to put in a female locker room. We don't even have that. So that would be an encouraging aspect to, to getting, an, an encouraging idea to get a female or other females to join the department. So there's some effort on my part. I don't have an answer in anticipation of your question. I'll stop there and I'll accept questions. Look at all this excitement on the left side. Councilor Cohen, start up top. Thank you, Chair McLean. I do want to touch base on the um, medical situation mm -hmm. in the ward and, and commend you and the police department and the ambulances. Um, not only did you potentially save a life, I think so, but uh, there were two out-of-state cars that we couldn't find the yes. the the owners, and they were towed in less than seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Two of them. So um, that was a remarkable call. That that day. was really yeah. good. But um, that's I just having it on a, a regular basis. Of I just happened yeah. to be outside. We were yelling and screaming, yeah. mm -hmm. and they couldn't get the ambulance down the street, mm -hmm. Piedmont Street. Um, I also want to just say I was standing next to Chief Miller and and some of your staff during the Hancock fire. Um, I would guess, you probably know better, that 30 homes were hit in some way by the fire, whether it was soot or some of them looked like they were going to, they were touched from the top of the building to the bottom, and we only lost a building and a, a third, maybe. And the bravery of the, the, the guys on, at, at 27 Hancock who were on the floor that was on fire, shooting water out the window mm -hmm. to keep the fire from spreading uh, is remarkable. I, I'm sure you commended them for their, I, I would say, bravery. It was really amazing how many homes and lives you probably saved. If it was at night, it probably would have been a different scenario. Um, yeah, and thanks for all the work at the O'Keefe 
you know, station. Um, I'm yeah, excited for that project. Thank yeah, that is really great. Um, I do want to say good news and bad news. The good news is you get new roofs. The bad news is you're going to someday put some solar panels on them. And so having good roofs is a, uh, a good thing because you can't put the panels up if, unless you have a, you know, structure that has integrity to it. Um, and, and you and I have talked about this. I think you're doing really great stuff as far as getting the buildings to a sustainable place, as I talked to Chief Miller about. Um, I do want to just say, if you need any help, you can let me know, but the state uh, incentives for the heating cooling uh, applied starting a year ago, February, to commercial properties, so you'll be able to get some of those uh, heat pumps and other things at almost no cost. So that will make it easier for you to present the budget in the future. Uh, but I want to thank you especially for the, um, for the Hancock fire and, and I think for saving the life. Uh, it was also on Hancock yeah, Street. Yeah, it was just <laughs> ironically. It was just ironically, two, two different places on the same street. But I really think it showed a lot of the teamwork, the way that you communicated with, uh, I forget if it was Wakefield or Linfield, Beverly, Lynn, the communities that came uh, we when had, the fire was we up. Yeah. We had 13 communities, um, whether at the fire or covering the city. Someone said you, you connected to 11 hydrants and... Yeah, we, I we, learned a lot about how you can transfer water from a hydrant to a fire truck and power it to another place. Relay pumping, yes. Yeah, relay pumping. So um, just want to thank you for, you know, the residents of, of the ward. On behalf of the department, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Marcillo. Thank you, Chair. You stole my question. But we can continue, though. Continue. Um, so what are you doing to try to... Um, Hire women. Well, our guys, our team, we're at every job fair, every school event, uh, every public event, and we have our a flyer that I made up, and um, it does include um, English and Spanish, one on one side, one on the other, with proper translation. Um, I had it professionally translated, and um, I'm not sure if we're going to have to start doing that in Portuguese. That's something I just heard tonight. But the, um, the female aspect, uh, in my pamphlet, I made sure to have pictures of female firefighters. And when we're in the schools, um, I encourage my staff who are there to interact with the females. I don't know if there's anything more we can do at the school level, but um, I'd be open to suggestions. In the state, in Essex County region, we, we discuss this often. Maybe there needs to be commercials, maybe there needs to be funding from the state level or something to start recruiting and advertising. Uh, I certainly would consider any suggestions. So what does the rest of Essex County look like with, with women? Very huh? few. Um, I don't know that there's more than a handful, and, and we have 51 communities in, in the, what we call District 5 and District 15, and we call ourselves as a whole Essex County. Yeah. So, I mean, I wonder if, for instance, I did a search. Yeah, please. <laughs> came up very quickly with Halifax, Massachusetts, on um, February 23rd of this year, had its first all-female team for a day shift mm -hmm. of three women. Might be worth giving them a call to find out what they're doing. I mean, point made. Point taken. Something's yeah. happening there. Yeah. Yeah. There was 11 women in in the Worcester Fire Department in 2021. Mm -hmm. Don't know what the number is right now. Um, 17 in Boston. Again, there's there's yeah. cities that have women. Um, I'm just curious. Yeah. What, if you look what at the percentage doing. that the women make up, it's still very. We have zero percent, though. Yeah, that's their number is bigger than ours. Granted. But we still have zero. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, looking at your data, um, can you talk about the jump in investigations for this year? It went up to 476. What does that include? So we have um, we do all our reporting by the NFPA standard, and um, everything is coded. So if, if you look at a lot of what we do, if you go to what's considered a call, a odor of burning, that would be an investigation. Uh, if you go to a flickering light and they're concerned there could be an electrical problem, that's an investigation. So to list all the specific types of investigations would be lengthy. So if you get the, the, the flavor of what, what I'm saying, there's almost everything we go to figure out that, that they're uncertain that there could be a problem, we would delineate that in different 
regards as mm -hmm. some sort of investigation using the codes. Okay. Do you, I mean, that's a big jump from 328 to 476. Yeah. We, we've seen a jump in calls like none other. Um, <laughs> we're approaching 8,000 now. Uh, even 2019 pre-COVID, we were significantly lower. Wow. Um, the city just seems to be busier now, as everybody would admit. It's more crowded. Uh, there's more events going on, more housing, more development. We just seem to be busier than we ever have. Um, motor vehicle accidents went from 197 to 257. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, again, the city's been busier. Last year, we've seen greater numbers than we've ever seen during the tourist season. Um, we're busier in those three months, and I say those three months, I count at the end of August through the first two weeks of November, equaling about three months. Uh, our call volume in that area of time is huge. And of course, if we broke down the motor vehicle accidents, the, the chief of police could probably do a better job of that. I would say some, some more of that increase could be seen during that busier tourist season. That's an interesting point. That would be yeah. interesting data to look at. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and then rescues of other types also saw a jump. So the rescues, if someone's in an elevator and we have to reset the elevator and do our tricks to get them out, that would be considered mm -hmm. a rescue. Um, we, we don't, you know, it's... It's a broad spectrum of calls that are, are, are deemed rescues. So, and yeah, again, with the increase in call volume, every every number it seems has gone up exponentially. Okay. Finally, um, I, every now and then I hear from constituents who live on the southern side of Highland Avenue, and they say, "There's more and more people living here, and we think there should be a fire department here or a fire station here." Can you talk about the response times to Southern Highland and if they're, are they also serviced by like Lynn or no. Peabody? We, we're the only ones that service Highland Ave to the Lynn line. And uh, it is um, one of our longest runs, I, I, we call it run time. Yeah, it's a long response time and engine four is probably our busiest truck short of engine one. Engine one is the busiest and probably very close behind it is engine four. Mm -hmm. And they have the longest response times. Uh, they, they do service the largest area away from the downtown. And yeah, it, it could be um, something we need to consider in the future. All the more reason why we're working um, when this new ladder comes in and we're fully staffed, I would hope we could keep the staffing uh, to a point where that ladder would be in service. Um, thank you, Chief. That ladder would be in service uh, at least six months out of the year, and if Manning were ever increased in the future, we could see that number more, because there is a need now, in particular, as everybody has seen the development on the Highland Ave south side of, has been amazing. It's been incredible. Yeah, so Engine 4 also does, like, uh, Marlboro Road and all of that yeah, to the Peabody yeah. line. Yep, and uh, that's where we had all our brush fires the other, the other time. And the chiefs fielded a call from me. I was there, and the Lynn Fire Department had a drone that they purchased mostly with a grant. It was $35,000. Mm -hmm. And the drone had infrared thermal imaging um, location. You could put drop a pin. It would get G GPS location. So when you're standing in nighttime and you see the whole sky glowing, you can't quite figure out where the fire is. This drone could drop a geographical pin and give us a coordinate, and we could... So we're not there yet, but that's the future. So I quickly called the chief and said, we want to get a droid that has those capabilities. But uh, yeah. yeah, I could see that would be useful. We yeah. don't want to put the horse before the cart. Let's, let, let's get what they need first, and um, we'll see how we can expand on the program. OK, thank you. Councilor Dominguez. Thank you, Chair McLean. Thank you, Chief. So happy to hear comments. Uh, very very encouraged uh, to see that you have full capacity and that you have the diversity even though we still missing the female side i see that in the other side you making some good progress i cannot say enough how important it is to have uh, representation of the community that you serve especially on fire and police uh, you know I had some uh, experience of people who doesn't really speak the English language and they cannot be safe because they cannot follow command so it's very important to hear that my 
questions. I had a couple of questions. I want to thank you once again for, for your effort. Uh, my, my question is in regard of the new uh, work that you had done in some of the station. As everybody, I mean, many people know that selling is one of the most orders by uh, station in, in the whole nation. Yep. So what you're doing is, is tremendously uh, appreciated. Can you say where you are right now in terms of those progress? I mean, are you, I know you mentioned a couple of buildings that you already did some reconstruction. Do you have any other in mind that during this budget period you are focusing on? Uh, I mentioned sustainability, and since the city has a study underway, I am kind of discouraged to attempt heating projects, lighting projects, electrical projects, and the like until the sustainability project gets started. And I know uh, Councilor Cohen mentioned funding availabilities, and the, and the people that are uh, that were hired to do this project for us are aware of these funding opportunities, uh, and they would be the ones that would initiate the, um, the, 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 the search for those. As far as the work I'm doing on the buildings, I see within three to five years, our buildings will be at a, low, a, a, a spot where we can safely say they're gonna provide a, a long, long, service to the community. Uh, if we didn't take the, the, the steps that we took in the last three to five years, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be looking that way. Um, if we can get the windows done at two more stations, if we can get the heating and air conditioning systems done and, and, and just improve the electrical condition in some of the buildings, uh, we're there. These buildings are going to serve us indefinitely. And if, if we stay progressive in the maintenance and not reactive, then, then yeah, that was my goal when I started. So I would hope within three, maybe five years, we'll be there, if that was the question you were asking. Yes, yes, yeah. indeed. Uh, the other question I have is regard to the education component. You mentioned, and, and I know for father that also your priority to educate the, the public on so many of the programs that you uh, present, because many people doesn't realize that you don't only take care of the fire, but you also deal with so many other uh, necessities that we have when it comes to public safety. In regard to the educational program that you are providing, uh, do you have any information for the public on where you're going to be at, at this summer period of time, try to present some of the educational program that you um, it, we do have an aggressive uh, education program that is run through our fire prevention division. Um, we aggressively inspect properties uh, and encourage code enforcement and when necessary enforce code enforcement. And hand in hand we consider that a, a roundabout way of educating. More formally the education takes place when we go ahead and schedule a class. Uh, we work with um, Trish over at the, the um, CLC and run some programs with them and they put a lot of word out for the, their participants there. Um, we have done some community projects uh, I believe in the Point neighborhood and we've done that through flyers that go out with the kids at school. Um, possibly some stuff has been sent out in different fa fashions that I can't quite identify. We do, do get a lot of grant money for education and our fire prevention division is in charge of that and they do a great job. Uh, we also, uh, as part of the grant for the um, AEDs, um, my goal is to teach CPR once, one night a month, maybe across the street, first floor annex room, first 20 to sign up. That would be something we'd get the word out in, in, in all communities in this, in this city, and that, those are things that are important. Uh, getting the word out is not always easy. We're not going to use code red or reverse 911 for stuff like that. But yeah, we're very successful. If we run something, we're well attended. And we just had um, a program we did with the American Red Cross where they went out on a Saturday and we, our goal was to install or to touch 100 homes and they're still finishing up. They're, they're, they're approaching 157 homes and over 285 smoke or carbon, de carbon monoxide detectors were installed. Um, if, if that doesn't make a difference, what will? Um, that was just a hugely successful program uh, organized by the American Cro Red Cross, facilitated by the Salem Fire Department and funded by National Grid. So through a partnership like that. And we focus a lot of our energies with getting the information to, to all the poorer neighborhoods in our community. But you can't 
quite call a neighborhood poorer, but neighborhoods that just have a more dense population and possibly a specific need related to that density. And that's how we drew up our areas. And the word was out, and it was very well responded to, um, and as the program can attest. So uh, huge success there. And Glad to hear that. Yeah. And I also wanted to highlight that you know the fact that you are focused on the youth in school is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember me growing up, I would like to be a, a firefighter. So seeing you in school, that means that you make some of the youth dream come true. So basically, in, encourage them from the early for the early age is very helpful. So keep all the good work on that. Uh, my last question to you is in regard to the new construction growth. You know, the fact that the, your responsibility is to save life and to protect people when any 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 of these uh, natural disasters happen the growth in the in our community for the new construction that we have versus the capacity that you have as a as department you think you you ha you can handle it i mean it is okay for now i know but if you envision any any increase on well i i i would love to sit here and say we need 10 more firefighters and and I certainly could use them as I mentioned it would be fantastic to have that ladder in service instead of six months a year eight or ten or twelve uh, we have to look at realities and um, I know that the council and, and the mayor are very supportive to the needs of the department and they understand that the growth has affected the police and the fire department and we just added a position to our department, which will be in effect July 1st, and I will certainly in the next cycle ask to add another one, anticipating that maybe we could get up to our, our goal of possibly having 94 firefighters on the department. Can we handle what we have now? Um, through aggressive mutual aid, we can handle it. Um, it, it it's, it's a formula that works. We rely on our communities. Um, would we want or have to rely on them? They're not always available. But more than likely, yes, we can handle it. Glad to hear that. Thank you. You won't. Councilor Prosnuski. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chief, for uh, running such a good bunch of people, thank you. such an efficient department, and such a uh, professional department that's, that at the snap of a finger is there all the time. Um, we're fortunate in Salem to have the two departments that work together so well, which is kind of unique because you don't see that in many other communities where the police and the fire um, get along so well and act as a team along with the, along with the uh, ambulance company. Um, you know, everybody's vying for budget money and things like that, and sometimes that creates a little bit of animosity. But in, historically in this city, the police and the fire department have gotten along extremely well and, um, and, and work together hand in hand in um, many situations, uh, especially when things get, things get really tough. Um, so hats off to you for uh, keeping that, tra that tradition going. Um, the, the comment I only wanted to make is, is I, I don't think uh, some of the people in the council understand that the, hi the hiring process, the hardship of the hiring process for the police and the fire department. One of the things that wasn't mentioned is that before, the, the, the police and the fire don't have the citizens to, as a pool, as a hiring pool. They have to go uh, to civil service. So before they can hire somebody, people have to take a civil service test, pass that test, and that's the pool that they have to hire from. So both departments are handcuffed as far as who they can hire. They just can't go out on the street and put up a banner that says help wanted and then hire people as they come in off the street like all the other departments do. Our civil service department really, really handcuffs that process. Um, I imagine it's maybe a little bit easier to uh, take a better take a fire exam than a police exam, but you know, you don't see the people running to civil service to take police exams like they did in the past. It's not the most desirable job. It's not, you know, it's 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 um, it's it's just challenging. You know, we can't get. You know, 28% of the people can't come out to vote. It's the same with civil service. The numbers are so far down when it comes to trying to get people to go out and take the civil service test so you can have qualified people. It, it, it just doesn't happen that easy. That's the biggest, that's the biggest hurdle. So um, when it comes to recruiting, it isn't just 
you, uh, come and we're going to hire you as a police officer or, or as a firefighter, you've got to tell the people to take that exam. That's the big part of it. Get everybody out there to uh, take the civil service exam because no civil service exam, you're not going to get the job. Thank you. In relation to that, uh, it used to cost recently $250 to take the exam, and the state has dropped the cost to $25. Um, so that is more to incentivize the, the, the people. Um, and, and if I may, sadly, we, we take a civil service list, and if I'm looking to fill eight, um, eight positions, I have to multiply that number by three and add one. So it's 25 names I take. And I have to vet all 25 of those names. Uh, and that's exhausting, considering I am a staff of two, myself and my office manager. So that's why you have the three to five months. Uh, and as you vet, a, mo a good majority of them don't, don't vet out. They're just not, they don't meet the standard, whether they didn't meet the residential requirement, um, their applications are incomplete, uh, on and on and on. And so we started to, to fill this group of eight on the reserve list, and I, I, if I kept calling it eight, I'm mixing it up with the last group. We started with, I said, 25, and now I have seven left. And I will be, fill that's the only ones that are remaining. So uh, that's that's how, how, you know, it's just a lot of people don't make it through the process. And so there, there's the difficulty we face. Thank you, Chief Dion. Um, you already spoke to some of your capital improvement priorities. You talked about the pump truck that's in there. You talked about the construction of the female locker room. Mm -hmm. Does anybody on the council have any questions relative to CIP for fire before we move to approving the department budget? Councilor Merkel. Uh, thank you, Chair McLean. Uh, I motion to approve the fire department's budget uh, for personnel for nine million nine hundred and seventy-five thousand and four hundred and twenty-three, and for expenditures uh, five hundred and twenty-two thousand and two hundred and three, for a total of ten million four hundred ninety-seven thousand and six hundred and twenty-six. Councilor Merkel moves to approve the fire personnel budget in the amount of nine million nine hundred and seventy-five thousand four hundred and twenty-three, and the expenditures budget in the amount of five hundred and twenty-two thousand two hundred and three, for a sum of ten million four hundred and ninety-seven thousand six hundred and twenty-six. Seconded by Councilor Stott. All those in favor? Two hands, including my own. It does carry. Nothing else. Thank you, Chief Dion. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oh, we'll stay and watch Bill. We'll stay and watch Bill. And last but certainly not least for our evening, we will hear from our harbor master. Not at all a reflection of the esteem we hold you in. Because you saved the best for last, I'm sure. Of course, of course. Good evening. I'd like to thank um, the chairperson and uh, the committee and the counselors uh, for the opportunity to present here tonight. Um, a little bit about the department. Uh, the harbor master myself is the harbor master. I wear many hats. Um, some of the hats directly correlate the harbor master duties and the mission. Others, the department absorbs through me along with me. So um, I just would like to say, you know, when we talk about the mission, our primary focus is the preservation of life and protection of property in the waters and on the islands uh, within the city's jurisdiction. Uh, we also, um, uh, you know, pro provide access to the waterway. Um, we do almost all the maintenance on the, um, or at least coordinate the maintenance through contractors for these access points, look at renewal areas, uh, put in for grants or coordinate with um, other departments uh, for the same. An example of that would be like the Willows Pier project. It, it, a lot of the projects and a lot of the access points are actually parks, and they always have been in the parks, but because of obviously my expertise with the waterway and looking at climate change and best practices and the uses, um, I get involved to help facilitate and maybe be the project manager. Um, we also, uh, 
taking, we do all, almost all our own boat maintenance, um, except for obviously the OEM uh, guaranteed uh, engine changes and things like that. Uh, we work a lot with um, the police department to uh, focus on grant funding opportunities through port security. Um, I, I uh, work with Captain Ryan particularly on that. Um, we, uh, I am the facility security officer for the designated port area, um, the city's end. Um, and we, uh, I and use my department along with the partnership with the police department to implement uh, mandatory MTSA regulations during city sponsored events. Um, as far as some of the other hats, um, I coordinate uh, the maintenance and I'm the liaison for the ferry. Um, right now, and I thought I was a little bit premature, I thought the ferry would already be uh, delivered with all its new machinery. Um, we did have a um, a uh, little bit of a glitch with the supply chain on some of the additional components that we needed. Um, I will say that the, I'd rather have a good job than a, than a, a compromised job. Uh, so to get the warranty on the engine overhauls, the engines are headed down to the uh, OEM factory for dyno. So they actually put them on and run them on stands and dyno test them throughout the stages of RPMs to make sure that we're gonna get the warranty uh, along with the rebuild. Uh, with that came brand new equipment and marine gears. The transmissions on the, on the uh, ferry were original um, with the vessel and every year she more than circumnavigates the globe with passenger miles. So that we could not get, if we had a catastrophic failure of the marine gears on either engine, we can't even get those transmissions or parts. So we're renewing those components so that A, they'll be more reliable, um, and B, that if we do have a casualty, those can be replaced or repaired. So um, I also serve uh, as, uh, port director and staff to the uh, Port Authority. Again, the department does take up um, some roles along with me, but um, you can see that in the budget. So I operate with, as a two full-time position, um, department for the Harbor Master Mission, that's myself and the Deputy Harbor Master. We fill the rest of the uh, roles and mission with uh, part-time personnel, mostly on a seasonal basis. We do pe keep people on the payroll, payroll year-round because we are a 24-7, 365 uh, response unit. Um, we do have an additional uh, full-time employee, and that is the Deputy uh, Port Planner. Um, that w we recently um, lost our deputy port planner, Seth Luttrell, um, who is a huge asset to the private sector again. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, between uh, myself, um, the uh, human resources director, and the um, uh, planning director, Tom Daniel, uh, we were able to interview and settle on a, 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 what we think is a great candidate who will start the end of June. Um, and has an extensive background moving up from uh, Florida, um, extensive port operations, uh, port planning, um, waterway planning um, background that I think is gonna dovetail well into Salem's uh, current and future, future needs. Um, having said that, uh, we do have some, a uh, few projects in the wings, um, you know, they're, relative to um, both the DPA, um, everybody's been following the uh, wind marshalling um, port initiative through the uh, Port Authority, um, the Willows Pier, we had a meeting today on that. Um, that will be uh, moving forward, we're just waiting for final permits um, from the Army Corps, um, and we're hoping to be out to bid. I'd like to say we're gonna be out to bid by late summer, but it could be in the fall um, for that project to take off. And then I have some uh, patrol craft uh, um, overhauls that I'm doing right now. And you can see a picture of one of the budgets of one of them that's ongoing. Uh, we did see some increases in what I requested. Um, fuel line items, I did move over what was a capital improvement line item in the last two years, and that was the um, web-based harbor management system. We're gonna keep that, um, that, 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 thanks to Anna and her crew, um, it's been a success. It, it was, 
it, it was a little bit of an uphill battle to make sure we were going to keep that because it, we, we got to ensure that we're giving finance everything they need in a format that they can um, it's useful to them and it's been a little bit of a struggle in that regard but it has given us 100% compliance with fees and it's helped immensely with um, the assessor and the excise tax and, and the collector and, and things like that yeah, for them to be able to uh, realize capturing everything we should so we did move that over into the regular operational budget um, from the capital improvement and um, obviously fuel fuel is, is one of those items um, and we did see an in increase in request for um, part-time personnel, which is is actually, um, we were close to that amount pre-pandemic, and then we did uh, reduce that part-time at the request of uh, the administration um, during the pandemic. So that's where I'm at. I can stop here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you for that. And actually, I will thank you for... Um, appending a lot of information to your line items in the budget, which is just happens to be my preferred format for budgeting. It's nice to be able to see the number and see exactly what it's going towards. Um, what, what was the length of the delay for the for the ferry that you said you thought would be delivered already? I, I was hoping that we were going to start with our own boat on uh, this past Friday. Um, we're probably going to be. I, I don't want to. I'd like to say we're going to have her within three weeks, you know. But let, let's say we're going to have her up and running by July fourth. Um, one of the big things is is just she has to be on the dinos for about a week, and it, and it's this transportation involved each way. Um, the engines are there now. Then they have to be installed, aligned with the new transmissions, and as part of that, rather than to put her in service after a yard period, um, we're going to send her up to the uh, dry dock to get um, painted and get her. It, it won't be a total paint job, but it'll be a touch up, get her bottom done, get the zincs done, because we've done to save money, we've done the overhaul in the water, so the engines were removed while she was in the water um, otherwise if she was on the waves would be paying a big premium it, it's it's a big job so um, I'm thankful for the partnership with the um, uh, the operator who's uh, you know done the, the port engineering services to try to facilitate line up the cranes things like that and it's been done down at their facility in uh, Charlestown so saved a lot of money understood thank you council Cohen thank you chair McLean um, you should get a bigger head for all the hats you've been wearing. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you have someone to replace Seth, because in my opinion, he's one of the most impressive people I've, I've ever worked with. And um, I'm, I have to say this, that I always look forward to the Harbor Master Report and the Port Authority meetings. and. You won't believe it, but we have another budget meeting at the same time, so I'm going to miss it. Uh, I just want to thank you because um, I've learned uh, not only from Seth but from you more about wind marshalling and how to get the port ready and uh, the stuff that you do with the ferry. It's it's really educational. I want to appreciate all the good work you do for the city that I think a lot of people don't really know we even have a harbor master, never mind all the things you do. So I, I just want to express uh, gratitude. Thank you. Appreciate that. Councilor Dominguez. Thank you, Chair McLean. And thank you, Harbor Master, for being here. Uh, I'm, I'm probably one of the person that Councilor Cohen just mentioned. I'm not too familiar with the work you do. But maybe like me, we can find so many people in the, in the general public. And I want to hear a little bit about one of the topics that you mentioned here. You provide input regarding the optimum port design for the offshore wind marshalling facility. Can you please uh, update us on where, it, where, where is the process, how the process is right now in terms of the wind marshalling facility that we're creating here in Taylor? Yes, so um, currently the uh, Crowley Wind Services, um, they are, they've contracted with AECOM um, as their engineering consultant, and we're at 90% plans. 90% um, sounds like it's a lot further than it actually is. Um, it, it, it's, they're probably within striking range of getting something together that might look like bid documents, but there's a, quite a few details to work out. Um, the 
basically where we're at with those 90 to 90 percent plans is a concept which would have a receiving berth along the jetty what is now the jetty and a outgoing berth or an onloading berth to go out back out to the leased areas where the traditional key wall is now um, there's going to be less attention to upland structure um, kind of with these wind marshalling yards less is more on the ground um, the real money is in the compressive strengths of the key wall and the burrs themselves. So just to give you an idea, um, there'll be nothing kept in the existing berth as far as structure. Um, the, the compressive loads that they look for for the outgoing berth would be somewhere in the vicinity of like 6,600 6, pounds a square foot and in the receiving berth about 4,400. Um, and that's to take the compressive loads. And, and one of the things is this industry, this wind industry, is evolving as we speak. So we're seeing uh, turbine outputs um, that are much larger than, say, last year. Um, so it, it's yet to be seen um, the size and, and magnitude of, of all the equipment, um, but they plan the construction for however you want to look at it, the best case scenario or the, the, the I don't want to use worst case scenario, but load bearing uh, scenario that they think they're going to need going forward. So that's about where we're at. Um, um, we'd be hopeful, to, again, to see bid documents out like by the end of the summer. That would be great so that we, you know, that the, the team knows what the numbers are going to come back looking like. Um, but I, I'm, without being in that type of control of anything, I, I, I don't want to speak to that with any confidence. Does that answer your question, sir? Yep. Councilor Prosnuski. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Bill, you certainly do wear a lot of hats, there's no doubt about that. Um, I'm just looking at some of the items over here that, that you've uh, that you've been um, putting over here. I see one that says uh, Moorings Cataloged. Um, is, it's ca is it capped at 1,035 moorings? Is that all the space that Salem has available to have mooring space in Salem? So, um, moorings and slips are, are, can be somewhat fluid. Um, for instance, Safe Harbor just added additional slip capacity to their um, docks. So we'll be capturing those permits as they're assigned. They also have rental moorings, and they base their rental moorings on a, and the reason I'm using them, because it, it, it is in the main portion of the harbor, and it's a good sized portion of the water sheet. So they have an Army Corps permit that was handed down from Thompson Marine, Thompson and Barney Gat. And it, it dates back to the 80s where they're allowed uh, up to 350 rental or transient moorings within the water sheets um, based on um, the harbor master's um, placement. So we have them right now, and I'm, I'm doing the final tabulations, we have them right now at about 250 moorings. And you ask, well, you know, what happened to the other 100 moorings? Back in the 80s, the average size boat was about 22 feet. Um, now the average size boat in that mooring field is probably about 35 feet. So obviously, you know, the larger the boat, the bigger swing room, the less space you can, you know, you can fit additional moorings in. We, we operate at capacity. Some of the things we try to be fair. Um, we have a list that's a public list that's online. Um, we try to give every one of our mariners or our recreational boaters the benefit of the doubt. We have an annual mooring maintenance program, which is mandatory to make sure they're getting their gear inspected. Um, it is a best practice. We also insist that they pay their fee timely. So if they don't pay their fee timely, there's a, um, a, a surcharge, a penalty of $30. And then if they completely ignore it, then we'd be looking at taking that location and assigning it to the nest mariner on the list. So to answer your question, this happens throughout all the mooring fields, and it's like painting a bridge. You get to one side, you get down the other. We're pretty close to capacity, and a lot of it, you know, you look out there and you say, well, there's plenty of water. There is plenty of water, but not all of it's that deep. So you get down towards Palmer Cove and Area Rim, they're really squeezed. So if you have a sailboat, I, we have a gentleman on the list right now, he's got a 50-foot sailboat. And I told him that it's unlikely we're going to be able to accommodate him at that end of the harbor. 
in most harbors, we say, yeah, we'll give you a morning, it will be out by Winter Island. The problem is he's not going to get launch service out there. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, we can provide him a spot. It's just not the spot he wants to be. And that's no fault other than the design of his boat and the topography of our harbor. So we are pretty close to capacity. You're going to see some more moorings go in. Some people downsize their boats, believe it or not. If they get older they, or they don't want to deal with the expense or the maintenance. And then if you downsize your boat, then usually I can fit a couple more in. So. I looked at it uh, comparing it to like parking spaces yep. um, in Salem. We only have so many parking spaces in Salem. How many parking spaces are there for, for boats out there? And I see that it's, it looks like it's 1035 all the way across, and I just thought that that may have been the limit. That's, that's going to be the limit until the way, you know, for the way. One's an estimate, and so you may see that fluctuate, but it does stay somewhere around between, say, 1020, up to maybe you might see it get to 1060 depending on the you know the allocation of boat and and, and some things that will affect it too like up in area rs if the uh, buoy tender comes by and he starts changing the the channel slightly if it starts sloughing in obviously we don't put moorings into the channel so we might have to shift some people around right right so the other thing I see that you collect a lot of money for the city, but on slip fees, mooring fees, and, 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 and other things. And I don't think that maybe some of the people don't realize that um, storing the boats at Winter Island, that was your baby. That was your idea from the beginning. And I know that the city um, makes, that was a nice little bonus, uh, good use of the land um, in the last few years for, for the city. Is that under your jurisdiction, or does that come under Winter Island's jurisdiction, the collection of the money? Does it, the, does it go to the general fund? Does it go to your back to you? That, that's an excellent question. So it's we a, revol a it's revolving, revolving account, mm -hmm. and, and it averages right now somewhere around 80000 a year, of which I put in an up to amount to spend. So I believe I requested sixty this time, um, up to sixty. And the way I project that is based on a twin uh, screw vessel, two engine vessel, what I think it's going to cost if I had to do two engines and a capital improvement. I try to identify specific known costs and, and base it on that. Um, the program is administered by my department. Um, we do thank the Parks Department for allowing us to uh, use their, you know, their property when it's, um, you know, not being used for other, you know, recreational. Uh, we, we basically take only the spots, the overflow parking. We try to leave all the, well, we do leave all the public access for the boat ramp spaces available. Right. Um, and it's, it's a little bit of an, uh, it's like kind of an orchestration of events, trying to get all the boats in timely and get them out timely. But yeah. we got a, we got a good, um, we got a, we're batting a thousand for getting them in the water and sure. out of the parks here. Yeah. And we were able to actually um, get the lot restriped this year. Yeah, that was a good windfall. It was a great, great, use, great use of the land. Um, and I'm not sure whether the council knows this, but every, every island that is out in our harbor is Salem's jurisdiction. They all belong to Salem. They all pay taxes to Salem, anybody. And that's bills uh, even around the corner all the way to Tinker's Island, which is far away from Salem, but it still belongs to Salem. But he's got quite an area to cover. So thank you, Bill. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, sir. Councilor Marcello. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a question about passenger vessels. Um, the line item for vessel escort and assist had a footnote that talked about um, Footprint has provided $180,000 mitigation funding to be used to establish a Salem Port Authority. Can yeah, that, you talk about that? That's a little bit of an older footnote um, okay. probably snuck its way in there it was on the form um, that goes back some uh, so as far as passenger vessel escorts we made a conscious decision uh, as did the the cruise industry um, during covid um, for you know visiting vessels it wouldn't have been a good picture it wouldn't have been a good practice uh, since then the actual birth itself um, kind of fell into a situation where with uh, some issues with drainage, it started to pull one, push one of the sheet pile bulkheads against the timber pier. I, I wasn't comfortable um, even after the pandemic kind of lifted and 
cruise ships started making regular arrivals in the area. It, it wasn't a, a comfortable situation with putting passengers on that portion of the pier. Also, at the same time, we're embarking on um, the wind industry, and there was a lot of... Uh, I would say plate spinning at the time, as far as conveyance of property, um, licensing, wharfing agreements, and things like that. So we made a conscious decision, so that's why you don't see any vessel escorts as far as passenger vessels. We have hosted some large yachts to the North Berth, which with the council's help, we did a capital improvement um, project on the North Berth, which was the old ferry berth. So we utilized that last year. There is a picture in here of one of the research vessels that uh, leased space at the dock for a period at a time um, and, and I even see that as the uh, wind marshalling project moves forward that north berth will be pivotal in, in getting some maybe smaller coastal cruise ships in on, on a smaller size um, but it, it's not that we haven't escorted any vessels it's just kind of a you know, we haven't taken the large passenger vessels since pre-COVID. Okay, seeing nothing further on the operational budget. Um, Bill, was there anything you wanted to highlight in terms of capital projects upcoming for the for your department? Um, you know, I try to fund all the capital projects with the exception of a few um, through the revolving account, which is the derived from the winter boat storage. Um, I do have, I did order a department truck, which was under last year's CIP. I did use CIP money for that. Um, we haven't seen that yet, so that's caught in the supply chain. As far as um, projects, like I said, I try to keep up with the, uh, the propulsion units. Um, we base our replacements, our capital projects, based on the individual equipment itself. Sometimes you get a good engine, sometimes you get an engine that you're not too happy with. We always uh, go with a manufacturer, and we've been lucky, fortunate to be able to do so. It gives us a three-year warranty in commercial uh, law enforcement service, which is huge. Um, so it was BRP. BRP uh, ended their relationship with the GSA and that type of uh, manufacturing. So now it's Suzuki. Um, and the, kind of the, the silver lining with that is um, we have a local uh, Suzuki dealer right up the street, and they're good about coming down. So we've done uh, three um, power changes with Suzuki. One is the new boat that we took delivery of. It was a PSG grant, Port Security grant. Uh, funded vessel, um, and then we redid the CBA vessel with the Suzuki, and so far, so good. Um, as far as the other ones that I coordinate, I think everybody's near and dear to the Willows Pier. Um, that is moving forward, because I know that's a, a hot button topic. Um, and it helps with the other facilities too, so a lot happens at Blaney Street. Um, you get the ferry, you get the commercial excursions, you have, people don't realize it, that, but we also uh, commission and decommission the sanitary sewer service for the ferry there, and there's constant people going in and out, and to have fishing take place there is not one safe, A, it's not safe with people handling hooks uh, along the harbor walk, and B, it's just, there's too many other uses, um, and, and it's detrimental to even the um, running gear, fishing line, this new fishing line, when it gets into running gear boats, it's, um, it's not good for it. So we're hopeful that the Willows Pier will be completed, you know, hopefully, I'd love to say by this time next year, but certainly by, um, you know, the following fall, and, and that we can direct all our recreational fishermen that fish from land up there. And that project, you know, is my understanding that we will have between the Department of Marine Fisheries, their grant, and what the city's put aside, we should be in good shape, but we're hoping that we get decent numbers when they come back um, for bids. Councilor Cohen. Thank you, Chair McLean. I, I meant to ask you this before. How is the anticipated dredging around the, the, the terminal, the wind terminal, going to affect Thanks. So there's two different types of dredging, and there's um, maintenance dredging, which um, I think everybody remembers we got a grant um, with the Army Corps. Well, basically, that was a grant from the federal government to the Army Corps for maintenance dredging within the channel. The channel basically stops, um, it, it runs from the end of the jetty between the number 25 and 24 buoy out between the islands. 
So that would be that portion, and, and that's going to not be disruptive whatsoever to um, the harbor, other than, you know, there will be dredge vessels in, in the channel from time to time. Um, there is potential for improvement dredging or dredging within the turning basin. Um, part of that would be to go along with the project. Part of that would be improvement dredging. And I can tell you that there, there will not be any loss of private recreational moorings due to that. Um, there may be a consolidation of some of the marina moorings, the ones that get, you know, transient moorings. Um, but that's yet to be seen because there's permitting that has to be involved with that. Um, there's, right now, there's uh, testing of sediments to see if they're gonna be suitable for offshore disposal or not. So that's yet to be seen. But with the construction period itself of the um, offshore wind terminal, um, and, and notwithstanding any, any improvement dredging, I, I think it'll be minimal um, impact. And certainly, whatever impact there is, if you are a private mooring permit holder, you will have a mooring. So. Councilor Merkel. Uh, thank you, Chair McLean. Uh, I make a motion to approve the budget for the Harbor Master um, for personnel for $373,897 uh, for expenditures of $60,049 uh, for a department total of $433,946. On the motion to approve the Harbor Master personnel budget in the amount of 373897 and the expenditures, expenditures in the amount of 60049 for a total of 433946 seconded by Councillor Stott. All those in favor? Two plus my own. The matter carries. Thank you, Harbor Master McHugh, for joining us and going through that with us. Thank you, everybody, for all of your time tonight. And I will take a moment to also thank um, our budget clerk for the evening, Eileen Sacco, who is not here in the room with us, but is participating over Zoom. This is a huge help and a huge lift for this nearly four-hour meeting. Thank you all. I will take one more motion. Motion to adjourn from everybody at the table. All those in favor? Everybody says yes. Motion meeting adjourned.